Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this gathering of people that are trying to do good for it, Cherokee Nation. I pray that you will lead us and guide us uh, throughout the day. And we thank you for all the blessings on Cherokee Nation, our, our citizens, and the tribal council. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, roll call, Kelly. Okay, let's Here, Joe Deere. Here. Maintain that physical distance. Okay. Um, so these are the regular departments. Um, if they're to the extent that some of the numbers have changed, it's because, um, like, you'll notice that ICWA doesn't is not its own any longer. It was moved over under um, Human Services. This is small, small lettering, small numbering, sorry. This is the funding overview of the comprehensive budget. Um, this is the largest budget that has ever been put forth to the Tribal Council. Um, and a lot of that is due to the additional funding that we got from the CARES Act and the, specifically the Coronavirus Relief Fund. But our total operating budget is 1.3 billion and our capital is 218 million. For a total, <clears throat> excuse me, for a total comprehensive budget of 1,526,400, or 526,478,227. So that is the largest for the year. Oh, I guess I don't need to look at, okay. <clears throat> this shows uh, the trend of our <clears throat> grants over time since 2012. As you can see, it has been trending up. And then there was the large jump into 2020 and into 2021. That has to do um, mostly with the increase from IHS for the um, compact with the JV and our um, additional CARES Act funding. Our federal funding went up significantly. So, <clears throat> the 
This slide shows our tax revenue. And you can see over time, and this again for, since 2012, there was a large jump in 2013. That is due to the um, compact being signed. There's a bit of a drop in 17, but it's been pretty flat and consistent since 2018, pretty steady. Um, I think that this jump in 17 had to do with gas prices um, from the motor fuels tax. Yeah. This one shows our dividends um, and where the and and where they're being distributed. Um, most of it goes to our gin fund operations. There is a statutory amount that goes to contract ser health services and a statutory amount that goes to the emergency reserve fund. So that is 30% um, goes is just our regular dividend. 5% of it each month goes to contract health and 2% goes to uh, the emergency reserve fund, which is a, makes for a 37% statutory dividend um, that's based on EBITDA that comes from our businesses. Uh, some of these others are, we call them special dividends um, or, or special MOUs. So there's the MOU with CNE for Marshall Service of 2.2 million. Um, the Housing Jobs and Sustainable Communities Act, the Career Readiness and the Durban Feeling Act, which you guys passed early in FY20. So that shows where those funds are going. Uh, yes. You spoke of percentages and millions both. Um, is it millions or is it percentages? This would be based on the, um, the, the budget of 100 million. So it's th the same. That, that would be millions. This uh, is our funding sources on a micro view. So where our money is coming from. Um, as you can see, the largest portion is IHS for health. Um, this year you'll see on their department of treasury and it has a pretty big slice that is our coronavirus relief fund um, and then tribally funded is the third largest um, which comes from our businesses i won't go through each of those you guys have a good idea on on the rest of those are pretty self-explanatory This is the larger bird's eye view of our funding. 76.7% um, is coming from federal. And again, this is larger than in previous years due to the Coronavirus Relief Fund and the money that we got under the CARES Act. That was uh, significant. So last year, our total comprehensive budget was $1.2 billion, and we got in total um, right at about $500 million from the CARES Act. So that was... It's roughly half of our comprehensive uh, budget. So that's made a big impact last year for sure. And will continue to make a big impact in FY21. <clears throat> so these are our discretionary funds. This would be gen fund and enterprise fund and where where that is being spent. You can see the majority of that is being spent in education, which would include our uh, language as well, our language um, classes. The Housing Authority gets the second largest slice of the pie, um, and then Community Services, the third largest. You can see some of those, it's kind of, uh, an inverse relationship there to the federal funding. So uh, where the federal funding gets the most, they probably get less gen fund funding. Uh, 
Um, these are the new programs, and they're not, so, so these are new in your FY20, if you're comparing your FY21 comprehensive budget to the originally passed FY20 budget, that would show that the Durban Feeling um, Language Center is, is new, uh, even though that was passed early FY20. Um, what has happened recently, and I'm sure you guys are all aware, is that we're gathering all of our language um, AUs, our language programs under one. We have a new executive director, which is Howard Payton. And um, so the reorganization on that is currently in process. Right now, you'll still see some of the language um, under the office of the chief and everything, because we haven't pulled all that out just yet. That'll be in a budget mod early FY21, probably, probably in October. So on compliance, um, the cash reserve fund this year is 15 million, which is uh, probably the highest it's ever been. And that is due to a $5.9 million increase in our um, cash reserve. That's a statutory requirement to have a cash reserve of 1.75% of our total comprehensive budget. So this year, the cash reserve fund is significantly increased. Um, on the motor fuels tax scholarships, we did go ahead and increase that by 2.1 million to be in compliance uh, with Legislative Act 3 of 12. Um, over the years, we've been kind of holding that budget steady, but our applicants have been increasing. So you know, when, after we got all the applications in, we were having to do a budget mod to move additional funds over there. This year, we just said, let's put it in um, the budget at the same level that was funded in FY20. So this is the level of scholarships that were handed out in FY20. Um, you know, it's my hope that we have, to, I mean, I'd kind of like to have to put more money in there. That means more people are applying for the scholarships and more people are going to college, but, um, we probably will be very close, um, if not right on the right on the nose on that one, and not have to find additional funds. That's what we were concerned about in this year, which is a tough year, that we wanted to have all of that um, earmark, so we weren't having to try to find funds later in the year. <clears throat> and contract health. Um, the tribal funds were reduced on contract health. However, we did receive additional CARES Act funding for contract health in FY20. So in FY21, contract health is actually going to have an increase, overall increase in the funding. It'll just be a little bit less from our Gen Fund funding, and there'll be more from the CARES Act and other funding sources. And, and that reduction, again, I will say the reduction isn't something that we just decided to cut. The, that is based on the anticipated dividend from CNB, because it's the 5% five, 5 of the overall dividend from our businesses. And that was what the reduction was. So I just wanted to point out that we had federal funds that is, is going to more than make up for that dip. something here about um, the transfer back to the general fund and then filling this in the allowable instances where we can use the COVID relief fund actually gives us more flexibility with that money that we're redirecting back to the general fund. Yes, okay. absolutely. I just want to be sure absolutely. everybody understands that. There's, there's strings and regulations attached to the COVID relief fund, yes. but GIN fund dollars we can use more to help individual citizens and there's a lot more flexibility yes absolutely <clears throat> what's the amount we're talking uh the total amount that we have <clears throat> flip flop is probably an ongoing number isn't it 
I didn't so hear the question. Did, did you catch the question? No. The question is, what's the total amount that we have put back in the general fund that we have been able to uh, transfer money out of the CRF? Uh, it's about $12 million. It's to date, but that will change, won't it? Oh, wait. I thought you were asking for what, what we were using for FY21. No, no, no. She asked her. Right what we're question. doing How, currently. What was the approximate amount? That, that we use from COVID, then we're transferring it back to the gym fund. Now, uh, we're in compliance, I'm sure, correct? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah, we haven't done that this year. That That is for FY21. Yeah. Have, so for FY20 thus far, we've been using the CRF for all the various programs that we've heard about, the, the tech grant for the kids, the elder funds, um all of that we haven't we haven't pulled any money from the third party revenue carryover from health into the gen fund budget for fy20 <clears throat> that's all happening in 21. yeah i see that once we transfer it back to gen fund i know that we'll have more discretion to spend mm -hmm. i just wanted to make sure at the end of the year our audits are going to be okay and be in compliance that uh, was yes nice. absolutely oh. yeah okay. we've had it's my understanding we've been taking gen fund dollars to meet these immediate needs yeah we did and then now that we've gotten some money from treasury we're able to kind of backfill that yeah. and it, it's all i mean everybody we've been feeding we've been feeding out of yeah. uh, the gen fund because they're hungry and they need it and that's a liable expense and it took a little extra time for us to get the crf uh funding but but yes absolutely to the extent I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about just about health money. Um, no, uh, across the board. Across the board, yes. To the extent that we, in the very beginning, and we, we did not have any money from the federal government yet with regards to COVID, we did. We pulled from our gen fund to buy extra food, to buy boxes, you know, all that stuff that we PPE. did in the beginning. Yeah, yeah the PPE. Um, and, and we will, we are and have been um, doing journal entries to move those costs over on the back end, um, okay. kind of and replenish what we what we sold or what we spent. Well, that's there. a good example right there yeah. of your gen fund dollars being able to meet immediate needs. Yeah, yeah. Gen fund has, uh, you know, I won't say no restrictions because every everything in a federal government has, you know, or not federal government in our government there are, you know, ways in which we can spend the money. We can't be, you know fraudulent or excessive or anything like that. So there are always some, but for, with regard to tribal dollars, it is, it is how this body and admin and everyone works together to determine the best place to, to use that funding. Um, whereas on the federal dollars, you know, it comes with a set of rules. You can only use it on X, Y, and Z, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. So how much uh, of have, are we gonna be transferring back um, for FY20, yes. um, I don't have the figure off the top of my head, but it's going to be, um, you know, the, the cost of the food, the cost of the PPE, um, some of the help that you guys gave um, to other organizations. I would say in the neighborhood of Five million. Is that about right, Jamie? Doesn't sound like very much. And we're going to the departments like the Marshall Service, maybe. Oh yeah, that's true. And and yeah. Um, I do. I just don't have it with me here. Yeah. Yeah. I would think you would know off the top of your head what that is. Well, some of it includes payroll and stuff, as it's. So it takes a while to get it. Yeah. Yeah. It will be. Um, well, that, that concerns me. I'm sure they're keeping track of what they're giving out. Yeah. Okay. Can we do it now? I'm sorry, what'd you say, Harley? I'm, I'm just letting this go because I can't 
here. Well, I'd like to ask a question. I want to go back to the motor fuel tax budget in 2013 was a big drop. I didn't see it on the paper, though. 2000. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was a big drop. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was a big drop. No, it's a little dip there. I, I have that. I can get back to it. Yeah, that t line on the top, that's tobacco. And it's so that was probably when we started our anti-tobacco campaign first. Okay. And then I'm actually surprised that it has held steady the last four years. There is a slight yeah, drop yeah, yeah. in... Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's what that is. Okay. Yeah, so the increase in 2013 where you see that tobacco line really yeah. jump okay. up, yeah, I didn't see that. that is when the tobacco compact um, okay. where we received 65% from the state came from. The dip in 2017 is due uh, to the rebate from the state being reduced from 65% to 50%. Okay. Um, and the new state of Oklahoma increased, uh, there was a new increase on the tax of cigarettes from one dollar and three cents per pack to two dollars and fifty three cents per pack and in fact it says in my notes sales weren't affected as much as originally projected because yeah, it's held it's held mind. pretty steady over that um, it, there was a projected decrease that didn't pan out um, it, it might be helpful to show the rebate coming out of that number too because it looks like it yeah, we, we had a great increase, but we're rebating a lot of that yeah. increase too. Yeah, so. that goes rebates back to the shops. Yeah. Does the rebate stay the same? When you rebate back to the shop, how does that work? Do you do it on a percentage from what we get? There's a formula. Yeah, there is a formula. For different categories. Yeah. Stuff, so. okay. Yeah. Carly, I can make sure Sharon is available to answer those questions when we get to the tax commission budget. If, okay, yeah, if you like. Okay, sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have anything else? Okay, where were you, Counselor? Trying? I'm sorry, I, I okay. sent us down that rabbit hole. Um, let's got employment? see. I think so. And counselor, I'll go look at my spreadsheet on a break, and I can get you oh, that okay. answer because I do I do have that total. I just not on the top of my head. Okay. Yep. Okay. Back to employment. Um. Go. Oh, Got to get back to the right page on my notes too. This is the total full-time employee budgeted since 2012. Um, you can see the big jump. Well, I say big jump, a significant jump there in from 19 to 20, and that is uh, due to the joint venture opening. Um, I've lost my speaking notes on this one, but that's that's where that is. 2020. It uh, does go up slightly, but that's also due to the fact that, you know, we've got um, a lot of the, the CARES Act. So we have a little bit of latitude because we're charging IDC to the, the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Relief Fund. So we're getting a larger pool in IDC so we can afford to hire more people, plus the increase um, over the federal grants too. So these aren't by by any means. These are all of our full-time employees. A lot of our full-time employees are paid through grants. So um, this, you know, on its face could look like we're in a rough year. Why are we adding people? But it's because of the funding source for that employee. This 
is another uh, different view of the the full-time employees. Um, it goes by department and by funding source here. So as you can see, health is the largest consumer of, of people and bodies. Um, We do have a little, a slight increase there um, over 2021, which is the next slide. And these are the vacancies. So again, um, the two largest departments, uh, which are health and human services, have the largest number of vacancies, which is pretty typical year over year. And that's it for the overview. You know, okay. health and human services are the two most basic um, things that people need. Yeah, so they are. And unfortunately, it, it, they're also some of the, the two hardest positions, you know, or two departments where it's hardest to fill those positions. Not just anybody can do um, it. Health, because it, it, there's you know such specialized training and schooling and everything required, and then human services because that's a hard. Um, it's hard on people mentally to to do that day in and day out. There's a high burnout rate um, with that kind of work, social work. So um, it's just it's a bit harder to fill in those, but that is where our greatest need is. So. It's it's quite a bit. I will say though that most of it, most of the vacancies are federal. Um, so that we'll, so a lot of it is we got a grant and in the grant was written a position, and so we're getting those throughout the year. And so we'll get the grant and the positions there before we can go recruit and fill that position. That, that, that only bothers me that we have these many positions and, and then we have that much money encumbered, but you just answered the question that we're not Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or in addition, we have the health department I think there may be some education. They budget the whole salary now the fringe and then they have to come back and say vacancy rate and actually back off that amount. Some of that total. Okay. okay. You have to have them all listed so they're in there so they can hire them if yeah. they can, yeah. but knowing that they're going to have a high vacancy rate to back off some of that out of their budget. I can barely answer the question. It always bothers me that we kind of had that amount of money, and I guess I thought we did, but we don't actually at the time because it's a grant. Yeah. And then you go back and it's all the time. Grants and, and IDC, yeah. IDC pool pays for. Uh, or, or several of these are budgeted on the IDC pool as well. I think over the years that I thought, well, there's $30 million sitting there that's tied up, and actually, it's not because of the IDC. Okay. Yep. So that. Anybody else have questions for Trey? Go ahead, Council No Fire. Um. I know on our conference call, I was trying to do some uh, digging on what we're spending. Uh, we have these capital accounts from healthcare. We're moving money from our, our healthcare dollars to pay for uh, last year's promises from CMB, such as the Wilma P expansion, the uh, uh, OSU Medical School, and obviously we have some gen fund dollars that they're not able to pay into as well. Um, we're back paying those through the CARES Act dollars. Is that how we're building back that money that we're spending out of health care to cover those costs? What, what do you mean by back paying? Well, I guess we have a, we have a large capital account that's set up for health care. It's supposed to be able to cover numerous things in health. And because we don't have the money from CMB now because they've not paid us dividend checks, that we're going to have to cover those costs somehow. So we're covering 
money that our business is supposed to provide to us. So we're going to pay from it with our health care because of third party revenue stream. It's our only other revenue stream other than the business that we own. So we're going to move that money to pay for those things that CMB can't pay for. So now are we putting money back into those accounts through the CARES Act and how are we going to do that? Are we paying for the employees with CARES Act dollars? Do I? Oh, go for it. Uh, Councilor, if I might, um, I would phrase it in a different way rather than backfilling. What we're trying to do is we're trying <coughs> to leverage the CARES Act dollars to pay for things that are related to CARES Act or coronavirus relief efforts. Right. So what we're doing is we're trying to leverage all of those expenditures that we can that should be and are necessary due to COVID. And then that's freeing up those resources so that we can then use the uh, insurance recovery and those, those carryover funds to allow us to pay for the clinical expansion, just like any other hospital would do. They use their revenue to offset and, and expand and then grow their healthcare system. Right. We're doing the same thing. So. It, it, it's a little different look at it. It's not necessarily that we're backfilling. I right. look at it as we're moving our expenditures to CARES Act uh, dollars that are legitimate and necessary due to respond to it, and that frees us up to use those revenues for us to expand the healthcare system. Right. Yeah. I mean, I understand that. Yeah, because we got commitments with we have to build OSU Medical School. We have to build Bloom P. I think we've already kind of got demolished the old facility, so they need a place there. And obviously the scholarship money with gen fund dollars that we've got to provide to these kids for education. Um, I just was kind of questioning where we're at as far as with C and B. I've seen that we have a hundred million in a budget of what we're supposed to, I guess, receive from FY 2021 for, for dividends. But we're having to cover their faults from COVID right now. So I, I'm not sure if that dividend that, that's is going their to be close at all from what CMB is going to give us. I, I, I don't either because it depends a lot on what the virus <coughs> does. Um, you can't see their financials. I've requested them and got denied on what we paid, which is what we paid them, uh, 69 million. I just don't know where they sit at. And if we're, we're, we're using some of our CARES Act, which is great. I mean, we have to. But if, if we're running this situation where we don't know where CMB is at, financially and yet we're paying for their mishaps right now with some cares dollars because uh, we we need to we have to cover those promises to our people um, where are we going to end up whenever we're out of cares money i guess that's where until we so, understand where the business so, is at financially how can we make the pro appropriate decisions uh, so few, four, we don't different. we know where the business is at financially you get the monthly financials so from the businesses Right, which isn't very promising right now. Correct. It's it does. That's why there was such a big reduction in their uh, budgeted revenue for FY twenty one, which therefore made a reduction to our budgeted dividend for FY twenty one. Okay. But I, I I guess I don't know what your. It's just they, they the business has a lot of expenditures and stuff that we can't see that we don't know exactly what they're spending their money on, and. We're having, to off, we're having to cover where they're spending their money on because we don't know about it with our health care money. I, and, I, and I think that we have to, and we're lucky enough that we have CARES Act dollar. I just get a little bit worried that if we're spending all of our third-party revenue stream to cover it, that in the future, when we don't have CARES Act money, what CMB is set up for and where we're going to bail them out with money then. So that's just kind of more of a comment than anything because I'm just kind of okay. a little bit... I think I, I maybe my disconnect is where you're saying you don't know what their expenditures are because you you receive the financial package from them each month. So I, I, we just must not be on connecting well, on the have, question. If they had fifty million dollars while we were pretty much shut down due to COVID and purchases, and and I don't know what we spent those on. So they they do have a budget book that they send us. We just don't know where they're actually purchasing and where it goes to. And that's our business. Uh, it's a people's business, and that's the money that's supposed to go to pay for things like our health care promises. We're lucky enough in that we've been financially sound enough to have built a pool with our third party revenue stream to pay for those things. And we got lucky enough with the CARES Act dollars. Just a little concerning to me moving forward uh, without knowing exactly where our business is setting up. 
so. Well, like Mr. Inlow had said, um, you know, we're using the coronavirus relief fund to pay for those expenditures that are necessary and due to COVID. Uh, just like any funding stream, you want to use your most restrictive money first, which is def by far the coronavirus relief funds, because it's right. got the the deadline of December 30th, and it's got all the other, you know, restrictions around it. So we're using that funding to pay for eligible expenses in health care right now, which is going to free up the third party revenue, which was a, would have had to have been used to pay for those expenses that are now being paid for by the coronavirus relief fund. So health is going to come out. It's, it's going to be a wash in the end. Right. So they won't next year. Health's going to be in the same financial position that they are now. Yeah. It, too, if I might try to add a little bit to that. Um, so for years, CMB has been focused on diversifying the business portfolio. And so that we're not just always relying upon the casino revenue. And I think that's where those expenditures that you're referencing are coming from, are those defense contracts, those government contracts that we have to fulfill because there's so many things in the United States government that are still moving along and, and they expect uh, those contracts to be met. So, it, you know, it, they're trying to keep their businesses going and they're also trying to continue that diversification of the portfolio so it's not always uh, dependent upon uh, casinos especially in the time when we have to shut things down to try and keep people safe so i think that's why you're seeing some of the expenditures that are out there um, and that and it's just the further efforts of them trying to diversify the portfolio and expand and uh, continue the operations of course the profit margins aren't as great as the casino operations but they, they have to spend that money and make, make that money as well. I think they're, they're trying to push that out and broaden that out. I just would like to see what they're purchasing their money on. That's all. I mean, yeah. I, if I you're saying that, that's great, but I don't get a chance to see it. So, all right, appreciate it, Madam Chair. And you know, Wes, we might ask Chuck Garrett. I know um, at last count they were 60 40, 60% 60 of their business was still in gaming, 40% was in the other areas, other diversified businesses. And I know that during this whole shutdown, uh, CFED, which is their Cherokee federal, Cherokee federal contracts, was carrying everybody. I mean, they never shut down, they kept working. And so it would be interesting to know at this point where they are as far as um, their diversification and how it's sitting in the overall business. So we'll ask Chuck that um, Thursday. We'll talk to you. Uh, I have two questions. The emergency re reserve is separate from the sovereign wealth fund. Correct. And is the sovereign wealth fund also, I think it goes by two different names, and I think that's what's, no, that's the emergency reserve. Okay. The 2% from dividends is on this as the <coughs> emergency reserve fund. Correct. That is not the sovereign wealth fund that was mandated. It is one of the funds in the sovereign Okay. The other, the largest fund is the scholarship reserve. Yeah. That's, oh, okay. that's going to be the scholarships around, the scholarship reserves around 55 million. Right. And then the sovereign wealth, it, it does cover a couple different funds there, but the 2% goes into that each year. Okay. And then we did not tap either the emergency refer, res, reserve or our cash reserve to take care of everybody during this. Um, we did. Says. Yeah, we no, did or we did not? No, no, yeah, okay. we did not. We did not. We did not. And so I think that uh, speaks well to our ability to move quickly and um, find resources without taking our rainy day funds, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else have questions for Trey? Now we will move into the office of the chief. Okay, Harley? Uh, so, that's all the wealth fund. So we are cracking those two, two budgets separately, the 2% and the uh, Yes. So yeah, okay. yeah. In the sovereign wealth fund, there's the scholarships and the yeah. It, it, each one has their own their own bucket, their own AU. A lady. I have a, a question. I don't know if it's a question. Can you hear really close? What do you see today? So far, it's talking about. I don't see what we're doing. It's pretty sad. Some of the large expenditures of the CARES Act. Being, what I'd like to know is what are they being spent on that is permanent? And what I mean by that is 
some tribes have built a big packing plant. That's permanent. So I guess what we've done is spent our dollars on getting OSU completed, Matt Lone Land Killer completed, and I think there's another project too. That, am I understanding that right? The, uh, so those, those are permanent dollars spent. Uh, yes. What they're going to be used for now for the next 50 years. Is what I'm so is there any more projects that we're doing that a lot of dollars of hair time are going into the summit? I know we bought two yeah. refrigerated trucks. <laughs> those are permanent. But yes, that's good. they are. I'm just talking about like the Loma Man Is there any other large project that I'm not thinking about? A lot of the funding is being used to make capital improvements at our CCO organizations so that they can also okay. do food distribution. Okay. So a lot of them are getting like walk-in coolers and, and getting set up so they can do food distribution within yeah. their communities. Um, we are building, um, uh, we bought equipment for, to make PPE, to make the masks. Okay. And then we're, we also have to build the building for the equipment to set in because it's very large equipment. We don't have a place for it now. So we're building a um, two in line, two, two buildings for PPE, five buildings for PPE. <laughs> um, and then there are also uh, buildings being built uh, near each of the, um, I won't say each, near almost each of the clinics so that we can move the testing centers out of the clinic and we can put our testing center and our um, contact tracers because they're having to staff up on contact tracers now. But the goal is to get that, um, move those operations out of the clinic so that hopefully we can increase back up to our, our you know, regular appointments, our checkups and that kind of thing inside the appointment at a lower risk. That is great. I want to keep my talking about that. I thought that was a wonderful idea. Yeah. I'm just wondering because we haven't got that report and uh, Yes, there are, and a lot of the a lot of the the that type stuff is still under review. We we have a, a an earmark for it, but we haven't got all of the specific budgets back in yet. So um, it's still it's all you know it's all it's still very just budgeted. We have a, a what we think is going to be a general number earmarked for it. Well, I think those are I think those are really good compounds. I think they're good ideas. Once you spend this money, it's gone. So you're going to get something yeah. permanently there. Yeah. We're, we're trying to be as strategic and long yeah. term as we can with those well, expenditures. I hear that. The other thing, what, what is our largest contract besides those that we have done? Largest contract? Probably, I know the one in South Saul where they come in and do the testing for the things like that. Yeah, that's, is that probably our largest so they, contract? We put that in as a blanket purchase order, um, and I think our placeholder is roughly half a million dollars for that testing. Yeah. Uh, it costs us roughly $80 to test, and we're trying to project out between now and the end of the calendar year. Um, and um, so that that's about half a million. Our PPE manufacturing uh, equipment is about $1.7 million. We look at the melt blow machine that's the raw material that goes in the mask and the N95s so that it was about 4.4 million uh, and we were just afraid we weren't going to be able to make it happen in the time frame uh, and so we scaled back on that just went back with those um, you know obviously with the construction projects that we're looking at we're trying to get the budgets together on that there's a, uh, some bids out on the street now that we're trying to get to back on what that would look like to, and then uh, I think uh, any other contracts that we have. Well, I think those are good ideas. That's, that's kind of what I had in the contracts And we're still looking at the, uh, the meat processing facilities and, and things like that. And, and so let me ask you this. Uh, do you have a budget or do you have, or we're going to spend 500 million, that's what I'm asking. Absolutely. That's what I'm asking. Absolutely. Well, I just want to make one correction to the comment where the Guma P and uh, uh, the uh, OSU are actually not out of care's dollars; they're out of health care. So we're uh, we're using care care's dollars to help to help to help the health department, so they don't need their carryover. But those are actually coming out of health carryover. So, so they, they want to be used in care of all of them. 
Well, we had originally thought that, but as thing as time went on, uh, we realized that the our biggest restriction, even though we feel it would have been allowable, our biggest restriction is that time cut off that December thirtieth. And we know we couldn't get Wilma P um, built by December 30th. So it was um, made the accounting easier and made, made it, you know, I guess cleaner if, if you would for an audit to well, take well, uh, so, uh, an area. Comments on the adjournment and the thing go back into the budget for their budget. I guess it's just easy for tracking purposes. Well, on what we were talking about earlier with the journal entries is that though that money was was spent before we had our CARES Act money. Yeah, before we knew what we were going to get. So, but we knew we had those needs out there, so we went ahead and bought them. And now uh, doing the journal entries to move like the food and stuff over. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Leg, did you have something? Okay. Councilor Shambo. Um, one thing that wasn't brought up at. Well, I, I know that this has kind of been a work in progress, our, our CARES money, but one thing that I read, I talked to Deputy Warner and Chief Hoskin about, um, you know, there's places in Delaware County where we, we've never had internet, we've never had cell service. Adair County's got places like that too. And, you know, and in talking with them, they're, they're, they're discussing about how to help those communities who've never had it before. You know, we want to go in and, and try to help people with this, uh, with their COVID relief, you know, filling out their stuff. We can't even go to Kenwood because we can't get uh, internet service. I mean, we can't take computers because we don't have any service. I mean, it's very hard to service those people, but, you know, Chief and Deputy uh, have uh, started the process, and, you know, Chief of Staff, you're shaking your head so you know what I'm talking about, but that's a major thing too i don't know if it would go on this budget or the next budget but well that would be a big deal to get these communities internet or cell service you know just for the safety of, of those areas that's never had before yeah. that would open up the door so much and I, and I know i read that you know there's an initiative going on now so is that part of this too yeah well we did just um get awarded our fifty thousand uh, dollar broadband grants so that will allow us you know fifty thousand dollars to uh, let a, an expert come in and help us with that and how we can expand the broadband and, and use it and, and to get internet to more areas. There's also a couple of other initiatives. I mean, we do have some money earmarked, um, you know, in, in the CRF for uh, helping out with broadband in those areas. Um, we need to engage that expert first to find out exactly how to do it because we want to do it right. Um, uh, and then, you know, like we, we just received the, uh, like I said, the $50,000 for the expert. We have it earmarked in the CRF, and there's another couple of initiatives that we're working on um, on the back end. I probably, it's probably a little early to, to say anything about them because nothing's, you know, been fully negotiated, but to help the students with Internet access. Right. So. I, th I just thought that would be a, that'd be a great deal because that's, that's really, really needed in a lot of areas. It is. I agree. Very much so. <clears throat> Councilor Shamba, very, very good point. You know, 50000 is a start, and I agree with what he's saying because the funds that were advertised for the elderly and the $400 for the students, you know, a lot of that was good, but the people that, that lived in these towns like Tahlequah, Pryor, Claremore, those people just go online and get those applications in. Or Kenwood, Marble City, Belfont, those people are going, how do we get this information? Yeah. So if 50000 is not enough, council can always come back and amend that budget to, to make sure that we assess this right and take care of that. That's, we need to build on that. I mean, it, it, it's a good thing. I'm glad you had that conversation. We have, it's, we have more than 50000 You can. So yeah. we have multiple projects going on associated with uh, information technology and connecting our communities. Um, this is going to sound funny, but right after 9-11, I was asked to attend the World Summit on the Information Society, hosted by the United Nations, and that was in uh, early 2003. In Geneva, Switzerland, we talked about the digital divide, and, and now it's that digital divide has changed completely. I live in downtown Tahlequah, and I live half a mile from AT&T Center. 
and the fastest internet speed I can get is 18 megs, but based on the standards, that doesn't even suffice as broadband or high-speed internet service. Edeer County has the best internet service out of 14 counties. Ozark Go is leading the way and blazing the path. But that is, we are not satisfied with that, and so we are looking at the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, which is wireless. Uh, we are looking at extending fiber into communities that don't currently have it, and we are trying, to, uh, we're even looking at Wi-Fi hotspots in communities uh, to get people out there, and then if that doesn't work, we're also looking at and evaluating MiFi's. Uh, so we're looking at it from several different areas and connecting community buildings and providing Wi-Fi hub zones around that. So, when I lived in Tuba City, Arizona, on the Navajo Reservation, McDonald's at 10.30 at night was the busiest place in Tuba City. Not because everybody was in there eating, it's because they had free Wi-Fi service. And every car was parked around the perimeter of McDonald's, and that's, that's how a lot of those people that lived out in the very remote areas would drive into town and get, get connectivity. So we are... We are looking at opportunities to create these Wi-Fi hub zones uh, in addition to uh, our long-term planning of expanding and increasing, in, in, increasing the infrastructure in those communities to uh, allow people to connect from their homes. So hopefully that helps, but you know, we've got multiple, multiple phases we're looking at there. Very good. And one other thing I, I forgot to bring up, um, you know, you get rural schools who, like at Kenwood, where they don't have that capability to, if they have COVID cases and they do have to shut down, they can't do the virtual because they they can't. I mean, because it's just not available. You know, Jay is still, just like you said, the library, Walmart, but now it's gone. We still have people at night that just congregate uh, by our, one of our real estate, and that's where they get their uh, internet service. They come to town to get it, they still do that. But, you know, these small communities, they can't, you know, they're scared to death that if they have to shut their schools down, they can't offer any virtual uh, classes for their kids because there's no service. So, yeah, I, I think this is very important. I'm so glad to see you all are on it. I knew you were. I just, I just wanted to make everybody aware that it. it's, it's a very good thing, you guys. You guys have done a, a good job and, and just so many unknowns. Even, you know, the budget is just a... a it's an ongoing, it's a work in progress. I mean, it really is, you know, trying to, that's a lot of money to spend and, and finding things that go under those uh, three categories. So they, you know, it's just, it's tough, but you guys have done a good job and I, I hope you can spend it. I hope you can. <laughs> oh, listen, if there's one thing I can do, it's spend money. <laughs> <laughs> Counselor Coates, Do you have anything to that, that you want to jump in about, or are you good just hanging? Me? Yes. Okay. No, I don't. It's, it's difficult to hear. There's a lot of paper shuffling, but I, I think I'm off. Okay. Why, thank you. Well, I forget that you're there sometimes, so I'm, I'm going to holler out to you periodically to make sure you're awake and make sure that you don't have any questions, okay? Councilor Crittenden, go. Hey. All right. <laughs> hey, I'll just touch on a little bit. Let's say all of our prayers come true and this stuff goes away in the next month or so. Now, there's still a market for it. PPE, we can use them in our facilities and things like that, is that right? Yeah, so... Um, Since we'll have the capability to make them. Well, yeah, right. with the PPE manufacturing, what we're hoping is we're going to take care of ourselves first, uh, and then we'll take care of our partners, uh, so I could see making offers to some of the five civilized tribes and some of the tribes in the state of Oklahoma that have offerings, and then if we have any surplus, we can sell them. Um, the... United States has a projected need uh, of 50 billion masks. Uh, our current capacity, and that's why, uh, and I think last month when I answered the question about the PPE and the mask, and you know, some of those items came from China. We actually ordered those from tarot vendors. Hmm. And, but they have to source that and bring that material in, and it's because 
the United States capacity to actually produce N95 masks is 3 billion. There's a 47 billion shortage across the United States for the projected need uh, just in a normal year. Um, and so that's why you're seeing so many of these masks that are coming from other countries, um, even though we're ordering those from tarot vendors, they're coming in from other countries because there's not the capacity. And I know that some companies are looking at ramping up and expanding that, but um, there is potential for us to sell it. But I, the first thing that we want to make sure we do is that we take care of ourselves and that we've got enough uh, for our citizens, for our patients and our healthcare systems, and then offer it up to our partners as well. So that there is the capacity for us to be able to actually sell that in the future and help cover some of that shortfall in the United States. So. Also, Ozark really is great. And I know it's not, not everywhere. I know you're not going to forget them, but there's, there's you know, still some yeah. bad places there. Yeah, there, uh, definitely we've, there's a couple of communities in Peter County that we're trying to address in the short term as well. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Yeah, Todd, is the uh, PPE production stuff that we're doing, is that going to be ran by CMB or is that going to be ran by us? Uh, I would really love for CMB to look at it. I've spoken with Chuck Garrett um, about maintaining that long term. Um, uh, in the short term, we're going to get those machines up and running, and then we're going to work with Don Kelly to help staff and get that squared away. Okay. We do have some uh, pretty significant tolerance levels as far as humidity and dust control in those facilities. Um, so we're we're got to make sure that we maintain that quality standard to make sure that those pass inspection. But uh, I, yeah, I would love this to be for business venture for CNI or CMB to look at for the long term. Well, we're always going to need PPE in our, you know, in our healthcare. Even if it's just to service ourselves. We're checking out the middleman, and we will always have what we need. Okay, uh, Joe. I'm just going off that. Uh, a lot of these companies around Tulsa are shutting down manufacturing and filling trade about this. There's a lot of these that have manufacturing setups. Have we looked at purchasing any of those for some of the stuff that we can do? Because these buildings are already set up power wise, gas wise for the purposes instead of building them right there. Um, there's a long term strategy with why we're doing what we're doing with the buildings. Um, and so we've got to, the short term, we're going to be making a mask out of that facility, long term. And uh, we might be looking at uh, a different use for some of those operations or some of those buildings in the long term. Right, I get that. I just didn't know short term. So short, yeah. Short term, I didn't know because you could do that and then rip all the stuff out. That's why I was wondering if we were looking at that. That way, that's going to shut the time down to getting something built. Yeah. Key, key location we have right, right. now is uh, these old Walmart and Stillwell, the C&I building. Yeah. It's already uh, perfectly set up to facilitate that as well. So we'll have some machines in there. Okay. Part of that is allowing us to create some manufacturing jobs in some of our smaller communities um, and create some job opportunities so that somebody doesn't have to drive all the way in from Belfont America. I just didn't know if the CRF funds would allow that. I mean, she knows they're all better. If you can do the whole building and use that funds for that, or did, did need to get another procedure? I believe you can. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Master. Any other questions? How about that? Okay, um, you can probably stay standing, Todd, because we're moving into the Office of the Chiefs budget. Uh, does anybody have any specific questions regarding the Chiefs budget? I have a question mark on one, or a check mark on one of them, and now I don't know why. So. Um, It's a small font they want to use. Could you guys make that a smaller font next time? <laughs> if the font gets bigger, the book gets bigger, so uh, I think probably the number one thing, and Terry is still here, as far as our community improvement project funds. Uh, I think you 
said those were left alone. I can't find them off the top of my head right now. They they were. We left those the same amount that was budgeted for last year. So I believe it's 40000 a counselor. Um, and additionally, you guys have a, an earmark in the CRF for additional special um, project funds. Of course, caveat with that is that they have to follow the, the guidelines of the CRF. And that we'll, if you get to an entity, then we will have to do subrecipient monitoring on that entity, and they'll have to provide the receipts and everything back to us so that we can include it with our report back to the IG. Which is probably going to be a nightmare, so have yes. those to me by December 15th, please, <laughs> <laughs> so that we have time to process and make sure we have all of our yeah. step in order. Uh, subrecipient monitoring is not uh, <laughs> going to be fun. Any other questions about the chief's budget? We've got the uh, language program in there, CCOs in there. Okay. That one's good. Um, Jody's here. He can go over our budget. Denise, could I just ask one? Yes, I'm sorry, Mary. Uh, could you explain the communication health services that we budgeted? What is that? Communication Health Services. Uh, excuse me, commu it's, it's, it's uh, Communication Health Services. We had given, um, in the 20 budget, we gave them $101,000, and there's nothing there. Well, I was curious what it was. I think that got rolled into just the... Um, into their operational costs. Yeah. So with the expansion of the uh, health clinic and its operation, it's been sorted to a small operation. So uh, they are trying to work on uh, different communication to get out more information. Obviously, since COVID has hit, it's increased the demand for health-related communications. Uh, but they're trying to make the clinics and hospital as user-friendly and have as much dialogue and communication going in and out with patients. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions about the chief's budget? Uh, looking at our budget, Jody, do you want to talk about it or anybody got any questions? <coughs> I think a lot of it was covered in the little pre meetings we had, but uh, the sports teams and Cherokee livestock options, I was able to cut 10% as uh, was discussed, trying to cut back on the general fund. Oh, We've, we've had plenty of money there the last couple of years, so that was no problem cutting those just a little bit. Uh, the general fund tribal council budget uh, cut 4% out of there. Uh, that's as much as I can do and still uh, feel comfortable with the numbers on that. Yeah, that's the, that's the general fund tribal council portion. The uh, indirect cost portion of the tribal council actually it's so heavily weighted on uh, your salaries and everything, and only limited things are charged otherwise to uh, indirect cost budget, like supplies, half of the supplies and stuff, actually end up with a 1% increase there. Uh, overall, uh, the budget was cut 2%, so $70,000 for the total of all of our budgets. All of your community assistance stay the same, your travel, Budget's the same, everything stayed the same. That's the reason why it was hard to cut because by policy, a lot of, a lot of your expenses, expenses are set, so. Any questions there? Okay. Uh, Supreme Court is the next budget and um, it looks like they did it looked like they did 20, I mean, 10 percent across the board, but I guess it's different. There again, it's mostly salaries for the justices, so not a whole lot. They cut back to the hundred thousand. Yeah, we move on to the Arkansas Riverbed. Hey, on, on the Supreme Court, when we when we have people assigned to the U.S. Attorney's Office, you know, kind of uh, like they used to do in the BIA and IHS. Do we take care of that salary or does the U.S. Attorney take care of that salary? Uh, I believe we take care of the salary, but it wouldn't come off the Supreme Court. It would come off the AGs. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. That's good experience. Yeah. Real for our people. Very good. Okay. We do have a person here. Yes, we do. We have our district court judges here. Right. Do you have something to add to the conversation, Judge Barto? No, I'm just here if you don't have any questions. Surely somebody has a question for you. I don't know. I just <clears throat> appreciate what you're doing, mainly for our kids. I, I know it's got to be heartbreaking work, but um, I appreciate what you do. Thank you. Keep up the good work. That was easy enough. Uh, judge, I, I do have a question for you. Yes, sir. In some point in time in the next couple weeks, would you be available to for me to talk to you? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Councilor. I was going to say, Mr. Barto took a lot of time with me on a certain case. I didn't understand the things and had a good lengthy conversation. So appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Okay, I think you're off the hot seat. Uh, Attorney General's office. Anything you want to say about that, Trey? Mm -hmm. uh, no, just confirmation that. Um, oh, uh, I'm sorry. The only thing that was there was your cellular board. Uh, so. They had a slight increase. It just kind of sits there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Attorney General's office. I was just going to confirm for Speaker Bird that um, those uh, attorneys that you just asked about are in the AG's budget. They're actually granted. Uh, they're actually funded by a grant. Okay. Their salaries are. Okay. Thank you. It's a good program. Okay. Are there any questions regarding the education um, budget that we need to get Mr. Bunch online for? So are you saying you're going to the education budget now? Yeah. Isn't that the next one? Yes. Well, I, I don't know if this is a question, but it's an observation. If you look at the, I'm looking at Joey's sheet, if you look at from 2010 to 2021, then it's double. I have talked in the education committee before about, we need to do something to, well, let me just put it this way. We have a lot of freshmen enrolled in college. I remember one time, several years ago, that I asked how much money that we lost, and it was supposed to be a million dollars. So far, we haven't done a thing to you to get those dollars back in recovery. So I would like uh, somebody to study to see how we can change that. A million dollars is a lot of dollars out there where a kid might go to college for three weeks and drop out, go to college for six weeks and drop out. And they got the two thousand dollars, and that adds up. It adds up to almost a million dollars for one year that I checked into it. So I don't know the, and I hate to say the administration, but somebody needs to look at this to see if we can't recover some of those dollars. And I don't know, you know, we always want to support education. I think we do, and you can see it by the numbers. But to me, we're just throwing money out the window when this thing happens. <coughs> Some type of plan. And I talked to Chief Warner, Chief, Deputy Chief Warner, I don't know, a couple years ago. And he, and he had a good program going down to Carl Albert. And I don't know why we don't implement it through all of our college programs. It really gets to me when we throw a million dollars out there and it just goes down the drain and nobody's responsible for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we, we promote education. I still want to promote education. Still, something needs to be worked out. Because he said the controller said all ago it's probably going to increase, and it probably will because it's, it's increased from six million up to fifteen million over a ten year period. So if you look at that, if you did a million dollars a year, that's ten million dollars that's going out the train. So I wish that we could do something and maybe lay it on to somebody to see if we couldn't come up with a uh, 
plan to recover those dollars or, or make the payment some other ways. I don't know. <coughs> if you could hold those dollars off to end the semester on I think we can take a look at it and see what can be done. The other thing, the other question I have is is on our uh, public school outreach program. I know uh, that was funded years ago when we took, I don't know if it's 5% or 25%, but Jody may remember, or Todd may remember. But we the schools, so we had the money there, and the school did a uh, project or a competitive grant. And so we cut that away, and now we put it back into the education program, and now it's an outreach. And I'm wondering, is this really being effective? Uh, I don't see Corey Bunch or anybody here, but maybe Todd can answer that question. I don't know, senior market was like a $250,000, $300,000. 5% that went over there from that program. So I'm just wondering about all we getting our money's worth out of the outreach program. Yeah, I think we are. Yeah. Thank you. 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 I don't want to fill this room up with a bunch of people if we don't need to. That's good. <clears throat> I definitely got a question on Sequoia High School, so if we got okay, a couple of people. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I'm, I'm sorry, <coughs> who do you want to speak to? Yeah, you should be in office. Councilor Buzzer? Yeah. I'd like to uh, go on the first question that you have. Why don't we take a look at the criteria that we currently have in place for to give out the, the scholarship money there? You know, and see, let's go back and see what legislative act that we have in place. And, and maybe we can look at that criteria, make recommendation, or pass legislation to the administration and see, see if it works. But I agree with you. And we may need to tighten that up because we're just handing over money and, and hoping they're doing okay. And, and a, lot of, a good percentage of them do. But we've got that percentage that, that where we're, they're dropping out and we're losing funds on them. We could be helping other, other students with that. So let us take a look at that. We'll have Shelly pull that legislative act up, okay? Sure, you bet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilor Crittenden? Yeah. We've had pretty good success with some of these work groups that we formed and, uh, you know, talking about it. So if y'all want to do, do that, already I'd sure love to be in on that one. Forming a little work group for that. What's the protocol? Let's form a work group. It needs to go to the education committee. Yeah. Can't do it here. Can't do it here. We've had lots of success with, yeah. with media yeah. like that. Education issues and the current and different things. But not here. I think we can get down to nuts and bolts on some of that. Yeah. So we want to take a quick break while Corey uh, makes himself available. Why don't we take, um, why don't we come back at 1030? Mr. Bunch, you're in the hot seat. Uh, here. And I see you brought back up. Yes, you guys know Jennifer well. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer is terrific in everything she does, and I could not do my job without her. So thank you, Jennifer. So this is where you say, do you want to talk to the man in charge or the lady that knows what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> we got this couple here. Okay, Harley. Well, hi. Chew on him. I'm, I'm just asking Corey to go ahead and explain because Corey and I had a conversation during the break. And it was about the, uh, uh, the outreach fund that we had that used to be a competitive outreach fund competitive grant between schools, and those dollars were, I don't know, two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars back, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, and Corey's like years ago. really familiar with the two and so is Todd, so I just want, he'll explain how we're using those uh, outreach dollars now, and how effective they are, so Corey had already talked to me, but Corey, would you go ahead yeah, and explain sure. what we talked about? Too. So several years ago, we did have uh, most of us set aside for competitive school grants. Hang on just a second. I do need to make an announcement. Um, I've been told by several people that those that are watching at home or um, trying to record otherwise,
can't hear us. I don't think anybody's having any trouble hearing me. But um, so speak up when you're speaking, please. Go. Carry open. Okay, I'll talk loud. Okay. All right. I hope, I hope everybody can hear me. But yes. Uh, Several years ago, this was a, a public school competitive grant process with most of this money. Uh, it's kind of grown over the past few years to include other things. Uh, part of it is the robotics, part of it is professional development, part of it is you, you may have even attended uh, the teacher trainings uh, at NSU each summer. That's very popular. And we've also uh, brought back the competitive grant process by uh, but it was, it was very popular, so it's backed by popular demand, I guess, and I know several of you have probably requested that, so I think it was last school year was the first time that they, they brought it back and funded 12 schools, I believe, for up to $25,000 each on those competitive school grants. So uh, that program will continue. It's very successful, I think. Uh, it gives the schools uh, the option to apply for what their needs are as far as STEM goes, and uh, so if you have any input on that, I'd, I'd love to hear it from your schools. Uh, if not, I, I talk frequently with, with a lot of school districts and you know, they, they give me input. So that's kind of the uh, public school outreach program. It's, uh, it's, it's a really good program and it, and it helps us meet some school needs outside of the other programs that we have. Councilor Legg. Yes, sir. So Corey, right now, if a uh, Cherokee freshman drops out, and we've expended them for those funds. Before he or she is eligible to come back and be on our, receive those funds again, they still have to complete the 20 hours of community service. They would, still, yeah, they would still need to complete the 20 hours of okay. or for whatever amount they got, yes. Okay. So there is some buyback as far as the, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Corey, I know we're getting ready, or we just started Sequoia High School today, back going again. Um, I noticed that we had last year's budget for the CARES Act, I think it's 478 uh, for Sequoia High School. Do we have any plans for budget uh, expenditures for going in, now that we're seeing some things come up, or uh, possibly ways that we can improve safety up there for our kids? I know activities have been something of a hot discussion up there. Um, any kind of one-on-one -on -one training programs that we can build to maybe have, if we can't have sport, can we do individualized training and set up and pay for some of the CARES Act dollars to pay? Have we budgeted for something like that or looked at budgeting for something like that? We are, uh, of course, always exploring different ideas and options, but yes, uh, one of the things that we, uh, we know that they're going to face difficulty with is the virtual offering. So we want to we want to get some people in place who can address just those specific needs if there's challenges or, or different ideas. But uh, yes, we're always looking at the, the different options for what, where we can help those kids uh, outside of what we've got going on now. Go okay. ahead. If I might, um, one of the things I spoke to uh, some of the staff was, uh, so as most of you guys know, my wife is a distance runner. Uh, she trains virtually with her coach. She runs every day. He prescribes how much elevation gain she needs, what foot strike she needs, and her watch monitors that. And she uploads all that data, and he analyzes that and says, "Okay, we need to work on X, Y, and Z of getting her ready for her next race." Um, and I, I'm, I've shot video on the track multiple times. It's showing where her arm stride is in relation to her foot strikes, and there's guys that are all across the world that's analyzing her form while she runs. There is every capability for us to be able to offer that to our students to train virtually. And we can do it through watch um, and give them the feedback to say, hey, you did great on that three mile run. We need you to start working on X, Y, and Z. Uh, and then we can also do some virtual things. We are trying to explore opportunities to get those kids in front of coaches uh, safely. Uh, but our ultimate priority is we make sure that we do it safe because I, I feel like we have a responsibility to do it for the students. We have a responsibility to do it for our teachers uh, and staff there at the campus and then also the extended family of those kids. So we want to do everything that we can safely. <coughs> Watches and other virtual technology options uh, are very doable. 
and the technology is there that can support that. So that's, they didn't abide on it initially, but I think we're gonna re-offer that back up and see if, if uh, that would be something. And if we did that, we were gonna offer it to all the students so that we're not uh, favoring student athletes over the rest of the students, so all the students <coughs> have access to that option. It's a good idea. I was just thinking maybe more along the lines of facility improvements at Sequoia High School. Um, you know, not everybody has access to a basketball gym and uh, you know, if our, if we, you know, for, for instance, football is not going on over there now, but if we had some sort of ball cleaning mechanism for football, we could have individualized passing coach training going on at the football fields and have them marked off to where the kids could still come up there outside of class hours if they're having to go virtual, come there, tra practice on school grounds in a safe environment that we've paid for to create those programs. I just didn't know if that's something that we've looked at budgeting for. Can we look at budgeting? I know that we don't have the uh, uh, 2021 uh, gen fund funding, funding yet, but I didn't know if that's something we could look at possibly doing. Yeah, Corey and I have already talked about uh, updating and expanding some of our athletic and workout equipment and facilities. So okay, perfect. That awesome. is definitely something we're looking at. Yeah, because we could be a role model. I mean, it, it, it could be possible that the entire state gets shut down by OSSAA, but we could possibly be the you know, model school of, hey, this is what we can do with our kids. And you could do that same over at Tahlequah or Vianne or wherever. Um, so, okay. All right. Appreciate it, Corey. Yep. Laura, I was going to ask uh, Deputy Chief to speak for just a minute. We were talking about the money loss on students that drop out and he had some good points to make about how to maybe close some of those gaps if you don't mind. Yes please. Uh, thank you. Well uh, good morning and it's uh, good to be here and Harley and I we uh, I remember having that conversation with Harley we were actually at Tri-Council at Red Clay Tennessee Harley when we were and he, he'd had some questions for me and and I think uh, one of the main things for me is when we came in, uh, you see new faces in the education. You see some faces that you're very familiar with, with Miss Jennifer, but you see you've got Corey and, and Chief, myself, uh, Chief of Staff, we sat in, uh, in education, and, and Todd's had some really good ideas and some things, but some of our expectations, the way that we want to look at these things, and one of those, and I brought that up, that you know, what, what do we do? How can we open up the uh, scholarship portal more? How can we save some of those dollars? How can we help our students? And really, it's a, it's a multifaceted approach. But, you know, I think the initial is the kids are familiar somewhat with what we do, okay? But from our standpoint, we've got some new people that have worked in the higher ed education area and different institutions and have these have a knowledge base of what's going on there. And I think it's important that once we get, let's just say I've got kid A that's in this pipeline. And when they come here, hey, I need money to go to school. Well, we, we're really good at that. You know, there's, uh, you know, help them get this dollar, get this. But some of the other things, you know, we have advisors and we have technical support and we have all these things. And on a college campus, you have an advisor. I don't think that the students understand how important it is to be plugged in with that advisor at school how important they need to be plugged in with us and on our end of it and this is where we we've got some work to do and some different things that you know help them have they by october and my this student a they come in and they hey i'm, I'm going gen studies right now i don't know what i want to do but by october if i'm that counselor here that advisor i want to know hey what in october what's your course of study for next semester you know what are some of the things that you're looking to do because they can only go down this road so far, all right? And they, they've, got, they've got several different directions that they can go. But once they start on that next segment of the track and they get down and they change their mind, they need to understand that they're going to have to back up and go a different route or life and different things happen. And I think, you know, what we did at Carl Albert, we, we, were, we had a, a sinking hole of funds that we were having to give back to the federal government through uh, Pell Grants loan, all these things that when the student didn't finish their part of it, which was a full-time student, 15 hours or 12 hours or more of college credit that semester, we're paying all that money back. So what they instituted was a 
a payment plan, for example, and they basically disperse money about six to eight times throughout a semester. Now, this is one college, okay? This is what they did at Carl Albert. As the educator, as the teacher, if this student was not coming to class, I would mark that down and do an early alert. And that early alert would send an email to that student, a letter to that student, several things. The key thing for us, it shut off financial aid disbursement. Okay, so they had to come back to us and sit down and say, hey, you know, we need to, we need to do a plan of improvement. You need to do these things. You need to come to class and all this, or you're going to default on your Pell Grant, and you're not going to get everything. That was able for us to capture some of those people. That way, we went from sending about half a million dollars back when we're talking a small little two-year community college. That was a lot of money to us. Sending that back to the federal government, we were able to you know, shrink that down, especially in the times that we were in. Now, the, the trick of the, this is our education team, they've got, they've got a lot of goals in front of them that they want to do that we want them to do. But we have to, not only do we go in and talk to the college presidents, but you've got to get into the, to the, find the CFO and, and to the business office and make sure and help them all get on the same page. Because one little tweak that you guys can make here can offset all the accounting and stuff at certain institutions of higher ed. So I think for all of us to go, it's kind of that uniting and coming together because quite frankly, those, those colleges, they need our students. We need our students to get educated because that's our future. But those colleges there, they need our students because that's financial security because we're sending Native American kids to school with money in their pocket that that school needs. So I think there's a balance that we can strike between what we do, what the student needs to do, and what the colleges need us to do as well and, and come together. And I think that framework's been set at $15.1 million in the coffers for these students. But also in, in that we've talked about, and I'll try to keep this short, we've talked about looking at student A, I'm going to go B, I'm going to get this degree, okay? Well, when you take that degree, what does the job market look like? What jobs out there can you get? You can't just stop there, okay? You got to take it one more and say, well, do you want to live at home or you want to move or you want to do so we can take that and, and there's statistics out there that will show you, well, hey, there, you know, take, for example, uh, accounting or, or MBA or whatever. There's so many things you can do, but hey, if you want to live in your area, there's not that many jobs there. Or hey, guess what? You struck gold. There's a ton of jobs in that area that can fill that scholarship. And I think that's what we've got to start painting an overall picture. Because I want to follow the student A all the way from the first initiation point when we met with this individual all the way to the end and what job do they have, where do they live, what are they doing, are, are they happy, are they satisfied, are they thinking about something else? Because that helps us paint a better overall picture for the next student coming in line. And then that's when we become stewards of our educational system, which is you know what we've done since before the Trail of Tears and to after the Trail of Tears, when a tribe takes 70% of its revenue and builds the first higher ed institute on this side of the Mississippi, that's a huge thing. And I think all everybody here understands how big this is, but we can't skip a rock on the way. We gotta step on each rock as we're moving through this process. And I think as we come together, we can paint that overall picture better for our students. I don't know if I answered any questions or anything, but I can tell you, you got an excellent team here. Education is a passion of mine. I've got, everybody knows this from listening, I've got three in school right now and it's important. And my oldest, I'm, I'm hoping that he can be like Caden Unger, the deputy chief's grandson, and maybe go be a lineman if he doesn't want to go to school, but he's going to need some college courses. That's the key. Remember that, 67% of all the jobs from here on out you're going to need some sort of college education. And I love the fact that you guys were talking about uh, looking at broadband and different things like that. It's on our radar heavy. And I'll tell you, you food security, transportation, two things that we're doing really well right now. Okay, Those are two determinants uh, that can be standing in the way of a Native American student getting the education they need. The other is the digital divide. We, we, we know we've been able to get more food out than ever before. 
transportation. Hey, next time you see a bus driver, tell them thank you because they're doing good work out there. Ain't that right, Sean? So I mean, and so we're we're taking care of these things, but once we get that digital divide work through, then you get down to the nuts and bolts, and these folks right here are going to be in the trenches doing the things that they need to do for our students. So, thank you. Thank you, Deb. Okay. Do you have any other questions in education? That's your Jody here. Hey, hey Jen, are we coming up with? I know we were having trouble getting some of the history books for the lower age. Did we ever figure out which way we were going to go with that as far as getting more books or where they were coming from? Not with the history books. Right now we just have the one and it's looking between sixth grade and twelfth grade. So we're looking at in some of our plans to come up with a future edition have some plans to go along with that before we expand it further. Okay, because the reason why it came up was the, the language classes in Tulsa with TPS. They were asking about that, which is Tulsa Book Tools in Tulsa. But uh, they were asking about the language program, that they were, they're going to use the online for some of their younger to put in there. But they were also needing some of the books for that age, too. So they specifically asked for those books. So if you ever figured that out with the virtual stuff going on and all this, I know it's a crazy time. Can you let me know? And that way I can tell the superintendent. She's trying to implement that with the Cherokee language classes in Tulsa Public Schools. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We got them here. You got any questions about the budget? You do not? Okay. Thanks for coming over. We appreciate you too. Okay, health is the next budget, and Dr. Jones and Amy are on their way. How would you all feel about jumping down to financial resources because we've got Trey right here? Anybody opposed to doing that? Okay, let's go ahead and do uh, your budget. Jamie's still here, so um, did anybody have any questions? about the budget or do you want her to just go over highlights or how do you want to handle that? <clears throat> Council. Trey, why don't you just hit the highlights? I don't know that anybody has any specific questions. Um, so a lot of ours is funded through IDC. A lot of our larger operations are IDC. We did do the 5% reduction in our IDC as requested by, we are gonna ask anyone else to do something that we weren't uh, prepared to do. And uh, our gen fund as well, I think there was a little bit more than a 10% reduction overall on our gen funds. Um, a lot of our gen fund cuts came from travel, uh, food, some of those typical, uh, accounts that we looked at across the board on gen fund obviously um we aren't going to be traveling as much next year it's just kind of a given so um you know the cash match um is still in there um you know but we think we have a sufficient amount to do the cash match for grants one thing i wanted to point out with that is that treasury has also said that um, in, in certain circumstances that the CRF can be used as our non-federal cash match requirement under the Stafford Act. So um, we, we believe we're, we're fully covered there. Um, that's really about it. Ours is a bit of a boring budget. Um, I can answer any questions for you. Um, you do have quite a few vacancies. Is that a um, is that an issue of finding people that are qualified or um, is it budgetary or no? Um, some of those came from grants this year. Uh, okay. We have kept our grant departments very small for many okay. years now, and as you guys could see on that that trend, our grant funding is going up, up, up every year, which I think is a, a because we centralized it, I think that shows that that is working well. Um, so some of those in, increases are gonna come from the grants. We're, we're kind of staffing up there. Um, and then the other ones, uh, 
could be hard to find positions um, because we do uh, several of them require accounting degrees so that's that's part of it but I that's actually one of my big things that I want to look at is the is the vacancy rate and driving that down um, because especially if it's an IDC funded position having vacancies in there could drive our IDC rate down so that's one thing we're looking at really closely and I've told all my directors that on the vacancies and I said you know if you don't get them filled then I'm gonna pull them so well um, a grant writer will pay for themselves times over so that's one place that you definitely want to um, have that filled so um, anyway I think the um, Oh goodness, there's so many numbers in my head. I want to say that we are increasing grants by like six. I think we're going to add okay. six new positions in grants. Yeah. Uh, that would be a combination of grant writers and those who report on the grants because the, the back end of grants is very, you know, labor Idiot. intense yeah. on doing all that reporting back to the, to the government on that. So Because we don't ever want to have to give money back. So Ooh. that's um, so Okay. Very good. Well, let's see if there's anything else that would be easy to uh, work on before Dr. Jones gets here. I don't really see anything here. The plan was to do health's budget and then we'll break for lunch because health is a big budget. So, um, <coughs> I guess we just need to wait on him and of course Trey Lynn is here if there's any anything uh, budget wide. Hey Janice, yes. yeah. ask and see how many have questions regarding that budget. Help? I, I was going to say too if I can try to be <coughs> Rover and check anything that while they're trying to get here if there's anything okay. I might be able to try to answer related to some of the questions you may have. Okay. Well it's just a big it's a big budget I mean in the number of budgets that they have and also in the number of dollars we spend and also in how important it is to our citizens so I certainly don't want any questions and he's walking in the door right now I don't want any questions to go unanswered get ready And let me go ahead and just ask you guys as you go on through here what other directors you specifically want to have what other what what other directors you specifically oh. want to have so we can get them in line uh Tara Lee's already alerted Sharon that we have some questions for tax commission but is there anything for David Moore or um Diane Kelly any of those or are we just good I will say that um, so health has very relatively small amount of gen fund dollars um, it's just those first few right there that start with the ones uh, and then everything else is IDC or federal funding IDC is the accounts that start with the twos and the federal the ones that start with the three Hey Mary, do you have? No, I don't. Oh, I absolutely don't. That's why I was asking if anybody had any questions because I, I personally, I think, I think the budget is outstanding. Yeah. Uh, sure, Harley. That's what they're yeah, here for. I have a couple of questions here. Oh, I just wanted to know, like on the first page, we have transferred twelve million dollars from those planning. Yes. So that that's part of that. Um, we're we are going to be using CARES money to pay for about twelve million dollars worth of payroll. So okay. Treasury okay. has come out and very specifically said that there is a presumption that everyone in public health and public safety are substantially dedicated to the mitigation of COVID nineteen. 
therefore we can use the CRF <coughs> to pay their mm -hmm. their payroll. So um, you know how we were, we were using their carryover, their revenue carryover, for um, to help out with Several. where we're kind of short on our gen fund. So we're also at the same time, like we said, using the CARES Act money to pay for eligible expenses under under that uh, under health. And so that would be that would be. And, uh, I noticed uh, Secretary Hayes wasn't in that. Why was that? The Hastings Hospital wasn't in on. Oh, because we had we didn't need to go there. We 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 needed we were looking for about twelve million to pay, and and uh, we got twelve million before we got to Hastings, and there it, it gets a little bit more complicated with their. Um, I didn't say this wrong. Their Medicare. There's like a Medicare. Okay. Yes, okay. Well, those are just questions I have. I do have another question about. Uh, there's a line item in here. I think Lacey Horn bought this up. It's three three two seven thousand. Yeah. I don't so, the question. We care about our girls. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's on the first sheet, second page. It'll be second, second page. Second page, seven one nine. Yeah. And I don't remember what my question was. Is it funded? I guess, and are funded the same amount? I guess that's probably. Um, it doesn't appear that it was funded this year. I don't think that there was a an AU. For that one. I, I'm, I guess I'm wondering, and I don't know if I'm to how effective was that last year? Because when she brought that forward, I really thought that was a good program. I thought it would be. I don't know why I didn't get funded. So, here's the pilot program to see if, it, if we yeah. could get participation. We were not able to get with participation, was very, very small. As a matter of fact, we still have a whole lot of those supplies that were bought still in stock rooms through outer clinics in warehouse that have not been able to be dispersed because we cannot get participation from the young ladies that would think would participate in that program. That's, that's too bad because I thought it was a good program and then uh, well I'm just wondering I don't know I don't know if the work was out in the community it's not supposed to make it work or not. But we pushed it all the way down to our providers. Yeah. Our providers had one on one conversations yeah. and still were not able to get participation. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, I think that's good. Yeah. Some, some programs work and some, yeah. Yeah. you know, we yeah. think would be a great idea don't work. And if they don't work, then we need to keep throwing money at it to try well, to make it work. So. You know, with a pilot program, usually it takes two to three years to get something like that up. And I guess my question is why we didn't fund it. A little bit and to give it another year or two to catch on because a lot of times when you do a program, it takes two years or so to get it. We still have uh, okay. a lot of supplies and so we're, still, okay. we're still actively participating, but there wasn't any need to buy more because we do have a, a warehouse and we have a lot of things okay. out there that we need to that aren't able to just to, uh, distribute out. So, okay. I had another question. Uh, Harlan, let me let me ask a question about that real quick. I wonder if we uh, filter down to some outreach in the schools because sometimes the school counselors or the school nurses that actually work with these girls will be for, more familiar. Um, do you know if, if we went that far with it? I don't. For okay. Sure off the top of my head, I know we talked about it, but I'm not sure how far it went past that. Now, okay. I'd have to check and see, but I do know we pushed it out to our providers. Our providers were having one-on-one -on -one conversations and weren't having participation well it may be that the the people in the schools that actually work with with the students day in and day out may have a little more knowledge and also a closer relationship so um, I may ask some of my schools if if they're familiar with it and see I mean if we've got the supplies kids need to be using them so well, I just thought, I just thought it was a good program when it got started so I'm not realizing you've got to do what you think is right for sure okay, okay. I got another question. I'm just wondering what it is to, again. Is uh, this Cherokee Nation project is L T U L S A, and the number on it is three four zero fifty three ten. 
And it was funded like for 1.3 million. And it had like 10 employees in it. I wonder, I'm just curious to what it is. Contract health goes. I, I see that there's a 15%. It's going to be 15% below last year. Um, and I know this is it's going to, have to be taken from different places. I, I know the money situation, but do you not foresee that being a problem? I mean, we we can only service a percentage of people. We didn't. It was never 100%, and it never will be. But you know, I assume that was a pretty high percent. But isn't that going to cut down on the number of people we service through our uh, contract health? Do you think that's going to be a pretty big factor? So the decrease that you're seeing actually corresponds with our dividend that we get from, from CNB on that, the 5% the that goes to contract health. So CNB's, you know, EBITDA on revenue, everything's going down. So that's where that dip comes from. That's the account you're looking at there. That's not, I mean, we didn't just pull that money out that's the projected revenue for this year uh, from the dividend, which is less. What, what we do have is an increase in uh, contract health through some of the CARES Act from the COVID relief money that we got. I want to say it was six, is it six million? Yeah, six million additional, uh, which should more than make up. Plus there was a $14 million carryover. There's a pretty large carryover. Yeah. We, we did yeah. substantially increase our budget in FY20 for contract health because we knew with the addition of the outpatient health center and the, the new patients that would bring there would be a greater demand for contract health services. So we carved, I think, about $15 million out of the joint venture money to put towards contract health because I don't know if y'all realize that we they do not give you additional contract health money when you do a joint venture. And we knew from experience, you know, that we would need that. So our spending, especially COVID has had a lot to do with that, but our spending for contract health this year is actually quite a bit below our budget. And a lot of that's related to our services being limited and different things. But in addition to, to that, we've also gotten six million additional COVID related contract health services that will have quite a bit of carryover from FY20 to 21. Okay, well that's good because that was a concern of mine that, you know, if we start bringing in more people, I mean, you know, just our volume is gonna go way up and. And we're we're actually uh, more apt to do that with our hospitals, so in our clinics. So, okay, that's good to hear. Thank you. So, at the end of the day, do you think it's actually going to come out about the same, Amy? I mean, I think so. I mean, we're we're slowly ramping back up. Our services are ramping ramping back up. 
Um, you know, we don't know, as none of us know, sure. what we're, how long we're going to be dealing with this and how long we'll be facing these impacts. But with the additional funding we've received for COVID specific, uh, so this is on top of the, the CRF funds that the treasurer is overseeing. We've also gotten quite a, quite a bit of money in health too. So I think that between that and of course our joint venture, and uh, we have it fully ramped up to that level of spending. So I think that we're really, we're going to be fine. Okay. For the next foreseeable few years. Okay. Councilor Dobbins. Uh, how, how does uh, the allowables from third party compare for telemedicine and teledentistry versus in-person appointments do? They're, yeah, um, they're a lot different. Um, we are very fortunate in our billing situation. We get to bill uh, enhanced rates for Medicare and Medicaid. You've probably heard us talk about our all-inclusive rates. And those do apply for Medicare and Medicaid patients. So we get to bill quite a bit more than a traditional practitioner does for that. And that's for in-clinic services. Um, when you go to a telemed situation, you just bill the professional side of that for Medicare. You don't get the um, technical side or the facility portion, which is the, the big money that we get to bill. So it is having an impact there. We are able to build the full fee to Medicaid, the full um, all-inclusive rate to Medicaid for telemed. So we're not having as much of an impact there, but it is, it is impacting us on our um, insurance collections and our Medicaid. Medicare, I'm sorry. So there are at least some financial incentives for us to go more and more into back in the in-person appointments rather than telemed. There is financial incentive to do that, right? I think moving forward, we've got to we need to look at a different model, a hybrid model of both, because people are coming to expect both. Uh, that's the way the private sector is moving. And so we've got to be prepared and financially solvent to be able to do that. So we're looking at different possibilities, different uh, scheduling models, so we can allow patients to have either or, depending on what they want or what they need so, this time. So, and to answer your contract health, uh, question two, we're looking at ways to bring more services in that we're not having to refer as many out, right. even though we're going to be increasing access and we do have more contract health needs, we're always looking at, at what those top dollars are spent on and if we can provide that service in-house, we're right. going to do that. Sometimes it's not feasible to do that, uh, but in other, in other areas it is. So those are the things, the metrics we're looking at to decide what direction and what service lines we need to really put our money toward to open up I, I think that's important that we feel that too. I mean that we know what you're doing to to help yourselves basically and it's not just relying upon just this is what we get and this is what we got. I mean it's good to be proactive. I, I mean that's that's important. You, you guys have done a good job. Thank you. I did have one question. Um, I did have one question about the um, health discretionary fund. Is, is that fully spent every year? It is. Some, okay. uh, uh, there are some things that, that come up that we uh, pull out of that budget. Uh, uh, most recently, we have uh, uh, some grants, a grant issue that we have with another with the Delaware tribe, and so we, we offset that with our own money instead of pulling out of that grant, uh, mainly because we don't have oversight of what's happening with them to make sure that we're meeting all those grant uh, requirements. We want to make sure we stay compliant with the grants that we do get. Okay. I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem with it either way. I was just curious to know if it, if it got fully spent every year. This year, our spending is less because of a lot of the activities with doctors. We correct a week. Things our like doctor, that. yeah, no, those no things were, were, we weren't able to. Do. <coughs> so, so this year is probably an anomaly as mm -hmm. far as the spending that we do typically spend on. Okay, and, and I don't have a problem with it. I was just curious. Councilor Shaw. Councilor Joe Deere, you guys look alike. Tom, I have a department. In a mask. In a mask. In a mask. I got a couple of questions. Um, the reorg that we talked about a year ago, does that reflect the new budget you're doing all the different stuff? And then I, the testing part, is that where are we doing the testing? Is it helping us? Like, how many people going through? Um, and then you can answer it all at one time. 
And then another one, I had to deal with Cherokee elder care. A lady called in and they sent her to uh, the city hospital. And then I guess it was based on what her uh, diagnosis was. And then when she got in, they gave her a standard test and she needed, they said they couldn't do anything until they got the test back. And they said it'd be five days. So I called Mr. Montgomery and he helped out and he got her a rapid test. And when they got in, they they got her taken care of. But it seemed like it was sort of weird that they would do that if it was like a congestive heart failure thing that they would make her wait five days. And then the last thing, did we ever do anything? Remember we talked about the school rewards with the gyms and all that before we covered it? Remember we were talking about doing rewards for kids and park things and so you can answer any way you want to besides that. <laughs> so the reward, the reward things are being done and they're mainly being done because of the necessity because we've added a lot of uh, positions and those positions are on the work chart. So we're reordering uh, those positions to get them on the work chart so that we can open them up. So uh, answer that question. Testing, we're, we're doing as much testing as we can possibly do with the amount of supplies as the supply lines have opened up. Uh, most recently, in the last few weeks, those uh, supply lines have started to open up even further, and so we've increased our, our testing uh, opportunities. Now, whether people take advantage of it or not is up to them. Our drive-thrus are, are open every day uh, on two weeks. Uh, we still have to be here and, uh, and to ER on weekends. Uh, our COVID clinics are open for testing, and we opened up our rapid testing as far as we felt like we could and still keep the supplies we needed for our critically ill patients. Um, as far as what goes on at Northeastern Health Systems, I don't, I can't talk to what testing capabilities they have. Uh, if we have a patient that's, that we can help out anyway, when we find out about it, we try to do that. Uh, and, and the elder care is the same way. We don't have oversight over elder care, so I don't know what the referral process is and something like that. And uh, how that occurred, but I'm glad, glad to know we could help. Yeah, Montgomery did a great job, and, and the reason why I said that there's something like a relationship thing there. Like maybe we talk about money to do that. If we're having to send our charity elders there, and make sure we get. But uh, so sorry. Um, <laughs> is that, was that a charity? Was that an elder a charity elder? Yes. Yeah. Elder care services both Cherokees. Indians and non-Indians alike. Yeah. Uh, so I just I was kind of curious as to why they felt they should go to NHS. I'm not sure. I didn't think I could ask okay, I, I'll visit with Miss Davis and find out what the issue was with that particular. I thought maybe that's why they sent that individual to NHS. She was non-Indian, and no. was, but if she was Cherokee, then I'll visit. I'm not sure. Sorry, interesting dynamics of that. Because I was like, I didn't know if it had something to do. One thing or the other, and we have the agreements in place that allow those patients to help. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, I'll find out from Miss Davis why they sent a particular patient to NHS as opposed to send them to us. You know, I asked him about the question we talked about. You want to explain that to CRF? Sure. Um, so earlier, Councillor Deer asked me about uh, what we're looking at with the exploring options of. A clinic-based system uh, in Catoosa, adjacent to or nearby the um, Hard Rock uh, operations, and where we have high amount of staffing. Um, so, 2018, I believe, if I'm if my memory calls correctly, there was an analysis that was done of what it would cost to uh, construct the facility there uh, that addresses both uh, it, primarily our employee base needs there in that area. Um, and so we picked that report back up and we're evaluating that. It was a little staff heavy um, based on my analysis so far. Uh, so that's one of the things we're looking at to see if that's uh, potential for us to extend care back for, uh, sorry. CRF. CRF funds. <laughs> Got to get out of the habit, the CRF funds. Um, and uh, see if that's an option that can possibly explore there to take care of those that large employee base. Okay. Are, are you good, Councilor Deer? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Councilor Dobbin? Yes, uh, Bob, does CMB have a clinic there for their employees? No, they, 
The uh, closest, closest, closest thing in the area is, a, is an urgent care that's operated by a third party uh, for profit entity, uh, and it's in that strip mall just to, adjacent um, across the road. From that, that's the only option there. Well, really we had discussions, I think, before about. Yeah. So obviously, we have a large employee base there, not only with the hard rock, but we also have quite a few employees that work in the Catoosa area tag office, career services, some human service operations there in Catoosa. Sure. Would an employee clinic include non, non Cherokee employees? Yeah, that's one of the things that we'd have to figure out, but yet, obviously, we wouldn't want to discriminate throughout right. that employee base, uh, just like we do with our employee clinic here. Uh, we service all of our employees. And that third party billing would offset some of that. Yeah. Councilor Crandon? Yeah, I'm just curious that you're talking about the percentage of people who actually live in that area. I know a lot of people who drive to our route different places. Be interested to know the there of people that actually live there as opposed to driving in. Well, in the Catoosa area, we do actually have some housing, Cherokee Nation housing in the Catoosa area, and they're having to use Clermont Indian Hospital for their closest um, Cherokee clinic. Um, so there, there would be some people. I mean, it's not a large housing. Uh, community, but there would be some. Yeah, I just thought it would be interesting to know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll follow that back up if you don't mind. My goodness, Joe. <laughs> well, we're, well, me and Todd's been talking about that's your question, Dalvin. There's an area over there that is used basically like a storage area. It has some modular stuff on that Flintco uses. It's using that area because that area's been there a long time. And we have so many people come from Salina, Jay, a lot of people travel. I mean, we have some people drive over an hour and a half to come work at the Hard Rock. So it actually be beneficial for everybody there during the day, especially CMB and CN employees. I mean, there's a bunch of people that travel from all different communities, even Harley's district. I mean, we got some grow from Grove all the way over there. So if that was accessible to even Sean's people, that's what we're looking at. I'm just curious, let them deal with the funds and, but that's the area we're talking about. So it wouldn't clog up the Hard Rock area. It's sort of right there beside it, though. So easy access, easy to pay. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. That's well, it. For general stuff, they're having to take off at least half a day yeah. to go somewhere else. So I could, I could see it being beneficial in a, in a lot of ways. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for health? Go ahead. Cancer no fire. What uh, do we have anything budgeted in anticipation for as the with CARES Act dollar in relation to behavioral health? I know I think I've mentioned that before, but I, I didn't see anything kind of specific. I, I've seen a lot of couple things that were getting cut, but there are just costs going down. But I didn't know if we had anything to put back in from CARES Act in response to behavioral health issues that we're seeing among our citizens with depression and anxiety. If we have any appropriated funding from the CARES Act to go to that. Specific, specifically identified for behavioral health. We did get quite a bit of money through our Indian Health Service funding agreement for CARES for COVID operations, which could be used in, in that regard. Um, but as of right now, there's not a definite plan of certain services or positions <laughs> added related to One thing I can speak to about the behavioral health program is we are evaluating it. We have made some changes with our reward. We are currently re, uh, doing a, a area, renovating an area in the hospital to move our MAP program over into the hospital and out of behavioral health uh, in the CNOC clinic so that we can have more space for counseling. Uh, so we are looking, we are expanding it and we're putting our own dollars toward that uh, that we had set aside for that year, for this year. So those, those projects are moving forward continually as we speak looking to improve those and, and expand those services uh, regardless of the CARES Act dollars. So we're already in place and <coughs> so we were moving forward. Okay, perfect. And did we need a budget for any more counselors in those positions or are we comfortable with where we're at with the number of staff that we have in that department? Currently we're comfortable with the number of staff we have. We need to work on our uh, access to care. Okay, all right, perfect. Appreciate it. I think that's it. Me, Ryan. Bye -bye. <laughs>
Okay, if nobody else has any questions for Dr. Jones or Amy, I'm going to cut them loose. Okay, guys can go. Thanks for coming over. Right. For dropping everything and coming over. We appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, I did have one question, Amy. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I thought my tab was in the next. <laughs> yeah, you should have. You weren't fast enough. Okay. Uh, under the, uh, let me see, outpatient medical coding, there's a wide range of pay rates um, for these people. I'm assuming doing the same job. I'm wondering if it is, um, if it is, uh, I, I forget what you call it, we call it piece rate in manufacturing where however many you get done, you get paid. Um, no, actually it's based on their certification levels because we do have some people that do medical coding that are not a certified coder but then of course we also have others that are uh, we also have some that take on an auditing type function their supervisory positions and things like that so that contributes to the, the varying wages okay all right that's right. all okay okay, okay. now you can go <laughs> all right thanks. okay we did financial resources community services I guess anybody had any questions there? The only one that I did, two of the staff might be able to answer this. Billy Hicks has got a drinking water improvement project. And I'm just wondering what exactly that is. It's a small, it's a small um, budget. It's a grant. It's a grant. Which books? Okay. Yeah, I don't know the specifics on exactly what that does. But obviously, Billy Hicks and uh, uh, his crew underneath community services uh, work as Harley knows. They work a lot to ensure that there's safe disposal of wastewater and then also uh, access to drinkable water that uh, meets IHS standards. And so I, I don't know of the actual specifics of that small ten thousand dollar grant, but it obviously it will go towards uh, drinking water or not. Right, I'll, here it is. I'll see if I can. I will. Um, I would just ask him about that in the resource meeting um, Thursday. Yeah. I'm just curious, nuts and bolts, what exactly? Yeah, a lot of times that it's for a very specific need based on a community because of their testing has yielded that they their drinking water is not suitable and so they'll do improvements to a infrastructure in a small town or something like that but, uh, I'll, I'll prime him and let him know to be yeah, ready so to answer that question. Watching. So I'll ask him about that at the appropriate time. Okay. Okay, human resources. Anybody have questions there? Madam Chair? Oh yes. I, I had looked at that budget and I had the same question about the tent. But overall, the budget looks really good because we're putting the travel funds in for water and sanitation within yes. there, so it looked good. I'm satisfied with that budget, other than the can. So, yeah, that'd be a good question there. Yeah. Uh, and I did have a question for Elaine, but I will. You know. So, if I might, uh, Billy's watching. So oh, he, good. Okay. He sent text message and he said it's a CDC grant to help our capacity to provide safe drinking water i've sent him a message of is it related to any specific areas or just a global um, use across the fourteen counties so he's he's watching and listening providing information so if i get an update i'll get it to you guys shortly okay well if um, alana is watching and she's also in human resources it says that they provide written response and feedback to every employment applicant. I want to know if that's actually being done because I get told on the regular that people are applying for jobs and they never hear anything. So I would like to know. I know that they try. Uh, to do there that. There is no try. <laughs> so, here, but here's, uh, so if you guys will recall, um, about this time last year, we announced the kickoff of the HR process redesign, and last month indicated that, that group has finalized their report. Uh, and so we're trying to find some of the low-hanging fruit of things that we can do to uh, improve those processes. 
a lot of this is going to be technology based and we're going to see if we can't possibly use some of the CRF funds uh, to help offset that because it, it would greatly reduce our contact points uh, that we have. A lot of times we have people that bring things in um, and providing greater flexibility to upload and provide additional documentation. Um, and uh, that way we have a better way uh, to communicate with those applicants. Um, a lot of times what has to happen is somebody has to physically generate a letter to a panel that may have had 200 applicants for one position. And so they, they miss some. And um, I will say that we found some staff uh, recently that weren't performing at the level that we've, we would like them to and we need them to do. And uh, we made some changes in those areas. Uh, to make sure that we have the staff that are communicating effectively with all the applicants. Well, I just heard numerous times about people that have applied for numerous positions, and they never hear, is it credentials? Is it, they don't even get a call back, they don't, they, they don't get anything, so they don't know how they can improve their chances of getting a job. And I have college graduates that have applied from everything from a job in their line of study to a janitorial position, and they don't ever get a call back. So that, that is something that it sounds like you're working on. I'm sure Lynn is watching, and uh, I'll ask her to <laughs> fill in too. So. Okay, very good. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I have a big problem. We Nobody in Sequoia County ever seems to get one, because I get a lot of calls. They wonder, and they, they'll find out. They'll be doing and somebody gets their job, and they never got a response. And they put in for six or seven jobs and never get an answer. Well, I don't That's know if you know this or not, but we, we put an embargo in Sequoia <laughs> County. Uh, That's not true. I'm from Sequoia County. <laughs> uh, so, it, uh, I know we've got some issues to work on there, so uh, we're, we're working on it, and we want to be better, and we want to communicate with everybody. And uh, So, much like uh, what we did with our student applicants, um, this weekend we communicated to each of them individually for each of those parents that submitted that. Um, and we had, where Jamie is in the process of transferring $19 million to our bank to be able to connect with those. And so that's, that's the same thing we want with our applicants. Once you, so you apply for a position, we give you feedback and let you know how things are going. So Hopefully with the process improvements and the technology that we're getting ready to add on, we'll be able to send emails and communicate back and forth with them like we should. So. Okay. Anything else? Okay, moving on to management resources. That they like adjust, you know. Oh, their biggest expense probably is food. They buy the food and then resell it. Um, so I mean, I think after time they've gotten to where they really know what their demand is. And they're buying, buying for that. Yeah, I didn't know if COVID wouldn't happen. Oh you well, like if you're if you're including COVID on that, yeah, then. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I didn't know if that since it is a pilot project, like maybe. Yeah, so they you're got. You have to reevaluate that later because it's it's not a real time <sighs> thing. Well, it's, it's not meant to be a money-making thing. It's a training program. Right. Yeah. And I'm talking about that giving them a real thing versus COVID is what I'm saying. Giving them a what? Like COVID took over, and then you're doing the restaurant. Right. To make sure they, that pilot keeps going when oh, all this is over. Yeah. That way it could give them a realistic thing, right. because during this COVID, it's not really given a realistic of the pilot project. Right. I got you. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. No. I, and it's a small enough um, thing. 
an amount there that that we can certainly extend it keep it going and okay yeah. that's why i want to make sure that it kept going because of the the time yeah 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 i see what you're saying yes it's yeah. actually been a pile for a few years now we get <laughs> yeah. some great funding some years we kind of have to fill in the general so it's like autopilot that's what i was there thank you Uh, I'm just curious, this goes back to the OSU and Steel Law Funding Fund, and what I thought it was funded through the CARES Act, and now this is funded through Health Department from Carrier Funds. Is that, is that, am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah it's, yes, it's, 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 it's from the Health Department the CARES Act to reimburse the Carrier Fund. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, third party revenue generated okay. right. so, so let's say okay. you come into the clinic we see you uh, okay. we have to run extensive tests and we bill your insurance Blue Cross Blue Shield a thousand dollars that revenue that we generate off of that goes into this pot as third party revenue and it's from a private insurance provider those are the funds that we're allocating just like a, a, a hospital would do if they need to do expansions or anything outside of that they'll take those unrestricted uh, revenue funds and build out a new ward or build a new pediatrics area or expand their services, and that's similar to what we're doing with those. Uh, so, so none of the care act money is going to go back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. If not, that that brings us to the end of book one. We're going to break for lunch. We will come back at uh, twelve thirty. So what's going to show here is that we are moving, we're going to pay for 20% of the Marshall Services uh, payroll costs with the CRF. Uh, that represents roughly uh, the first quarter. We didn't do a full 25% because we wanted to, you know, make sure we had enough um, time there in the end to do the reporting and stuff. But so the first, like, 20, about 20% is going to be charged to the CRF. That represents sort of their salary through December 30th. The remainder of it is going um, to be moved over and paid for with our CARES Act DOI money. Okay. Um, we got about $4 million uh, DOI from the CARES Act uh, that's got a pretty, pretty wide range of things you can use it for, and that's what we're going to use it for to the extent that um, uh, they their charges, their their use of funds exceeds that MOU with C&E. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I hate to even bring this up, but I'm gonna. Okay. Yeah. You know, at some point in time, we are going to have to expand our marshal service, and um, does this? I don't know. What? What's? What has that been thought about? It's definitely been thought about, and I actually think that the um, AG's office has engaged someone maybe to kind of take a look at that. Is that true? It, it brought someone on to take a look at really what those numbers would be. Um, you know, looking at it from a we do everything, you know, the, the highest number it could possibly be down to some, um, you know, more reasonable number, you know, considering if we can partner with the state and the feds to, you know, share some of this new responsibility. Um, we don't have those numbers yet, so that's not in this budget, but that is definitely something we've thought about uh, and we continue to think about how that will be funded. Okay, thank you. I'm Councilor um, I think what you'll see is you'll see a short term plan and a long term plan from us. You know, the council set forth this commission that's supposed to take all this input and come up with recommendations and some uh, guidelines of how we should move forward with this, and that's the long-term game. And that, that report's due at the end of the year. In the short term, you'll probably see us maybe come back and ask for some things uh, to be reallocated, um, just given the timing of the decision. And all this stuff with the team budgets and everything is already in well, play in progress. Uh, so they're you could see some additional requests or some other from us on a short-term game as well. well I, I know that this was a, a great decision, but it's pretty much understood that the progressiveness of it is going to be all for the five tribes, and at some point in time, it's going to come to a head, I guess. So I just, I, I know we'll, we'll be prepared to do what we need to do. And, I was just wondering about if that was taken into consideration, I, which I already probably knew the answer, but I just wanted to hear it. It is, and, and I think that for that sovereignty commission, that's where we're going to present some more hard numbers on what, what that looks like, what those plans will, will cost. Anything else <coughs> there? Okay, let's move on into the um, gaming commission. Seven is where uh, multiple projects yeah, go in and a lot of I mean so a big portion of what goes into that 477 is the CDC funding and last year um, human services it's, CDC got 50 uh, 52 million regular funding and then they got an additional 13 million from the CARES Act so they got over 60 million last year and it's just a matter of um, being able to spin those quick enough so we've got plans out there to build new CDC centers and um, expand others so it's just a matter of we're getting a lot of funding coming at us and which was a big jump um, uh, I think when this federal administration took place I think it was one of um, uh, Ivanka Trump's kind of platforms so there was a, a significant increase in that funding and it's just been 
being able to spend it as quick. But yes, that there are plans for all of that funding. And then I just want to, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It is. Get that money in advance, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and two, if I might, uh, one of the things we want to make sure that we do is that we don't ramp up, and then two years from now, all of this money dries up, and then we have a reduction of force, we're having to stop services. Uh, we want to make sure any any advances or developments that we make with child care is sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why we're looking at some of the expansions of, and, and doing some capital investments and including storm shelters and other things like that. Um, we are looking at some growth and expansion in that area, but we want to do it smartly and not find ourselves in a situation where we're, we're stuck with a facility that we can't really operate. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Are you ready to move on to the housing authority? <coughs> Any questions there? Okay, we'll the I just have a comment. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Todd, one of the, and we have very many, but I, I, we need a somehow make a recommendation to the housing authority to put somebody in there that you can call that will take care of business <laughs> and, and carry it out. And, and I'll tell you what, there's a lady we have working for us here named Ray Wakachi. You can call Ray and tell her about a hot water tank, a housing, a car problem, almost anything under the sun, and she'll get back with you within minutes and get it done. We don't have that at housing authority. And, and, and because they're busy, they've got the, the director and so forth, but we need to put something in that budget to have somebody like a Gail Miller or Ray Wakachi that can get back and take care of services. Uh, it's not happening right now. Maybe you guys have better luck than I do. I, I can't get much response. And I can get a hold of Ray, and we'll get things done that day, but we only have one Ray Wakachi. Yeah. Uh I hear you, uh, and I agree with you. Ray does a tremendous job uh, of keeping up with that, and she, she's like a bulldog when she gets on it. Now, as far as getting another Gail Miller, you, you're really pushing my buttons there. I don't know if you're going to take Gail Miller's message. Wait for that seven-second delay to see if she starts doing this. Okay. If she takes her shoes off, let me know. That's when it's going to get serious. Uh, but uh, I agree. We uh, we need to find uh, somebody to help. They out do. Of they do. What, you know, they're very familiar with HUD regs, and they keep us out of trouble. They just need that person that, while they're busy, that can take care of our business. If it's something we need to add in the budget, then let us know. And I know you guys are working. I'll, I'll visit with Gary and Irma and, and see if we can come up with a plan to address that. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I can hear now. <laughs> All she's doing is looking out for us. I got she's like a mom bear. So, okay, uh, Sharon's on her way. So, if you guys don't mind, let's drop down to the election commission's budget. They do have um, an election this year, so they're going to have to ramp up some for that. They always need more in an election year than they do in a non-election year. So if there's no questions of the election commission, go on down to <coughs> Cherokee Publ Publications. Everybody good there? Okay, Secretary of Natural Resources. <laughs> Um, do you have questions, Chair? I'm trying to see. Uh, I mean, I've already discussed my the questions that I had about that budget. So, does anybody else have any questions there? Oh, Madam Chair, uh, I might. Uh, go ahead. I, didn't, I didn't comment on the election commission. <laughs> we might do a budget mod later. They're likely going to request an investigator uh, in the upcoming election. Yeah. Investigate complaints. 
something. We have to, we have to be prepared to move with them at an election year. That's right. Um, you do, you do community service. Don't you? I would like. Um, I think it's Rex. You do natural resources. Yeah. Would you request that um, Chad come in and update us on what's going on with the land field? Just, I mean, we have plans to close it out, and we bought some more equipment. I would just kind of like to know where we are in that ten-year plan. Okay. Maybe in September or something. Can we do that. Okay. So that is everything but tax commission and Sharon should be here just shortly. <clears throat> so does anybody have any questions overall, not about a specific budget or do you want Jody to go over the whole thing? Otherwise after that, uh, after Sharon comes in, we'll be ready to vote. If if everybody's okay with the elements of it. <clears throat> Jody, is there anything you need to cover or want to cover that we should know? <clears throat> this hard rock yeah, mask is, my cable, guys. I can read through it good, but it's so tight that I can't move my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard. Why is the slot we gave you one special. <laughs> um, one, I mean, pretty much as we've all kind of seen, most of the expenditures are pretty much either level or slight decreases other than all of our uh, CFR funds. One thing that I wanted to cover that uh, we haven't really addressed is the uh, general fund carryover generally we take like right now we take 2019's carryover bring into 2021 and uh, this year we actually had a pretty substantial carryover coming from uh, 2019 and we n normally don't consider things in like 2020 bring forward but this year we kind of did a little exception to that because what we're looking at in 2020 is a negative. So uh, the, I've reviewed the calculation uh, that they've done and I agree with doing that because we have uh, such reduced dividends in 2020. We're actually reducing the amount of carryover coming into 2021. And uh, we're bringing in five million uh, as general fund carryover. And like I say, I've reviewed that calculation that uh, Jamie's done and agree with that. Uh, and other than that, uh, they've been creative in, uh, you know, finding uh, uh, motor fuel tax uh, carryover from the scholarships from the last five years, bringing in that money, bringing in the interest earnings from the Public Law 10277 uh, interest earnings. Uh, is you know the being creative not I'm, I'm being positive on that but uh, being creative in finding ways to uh, fund our levels that try to keep all the services at the same level so. sometimes the word creative and yes i know has a negative connotation <laughs> in this case yeah I I'm, make, I'm being make it clear that it was <laughs> <laughs> well, digging uh you know finding all the sources that that are out there, including the interest earnings and uh, there's the tax. All, all those kind of carryover sources that we usually we're not trying to find every little dollar that we can, but uh, they did a good job of, of that. And that's like that interest earnings on that, the uh, public law 102 that's we get funded in advance on that, similar to uh, self government. So we Built up quite a little. You'll, you can build it when you become chief. The uh, windfall yeah, there, so right here, but then. Go ahead. So, usually, I guess what you're saying, Jody, is on our interest earnings in the past, we really haven't carried all those dollars. Put them in a carryover fund. Right. We, okay. They've just been kind of accumulating yeah. a little bit over time, and uh, uh, this year we've had to. Had to use those, so. so I guess my question is 
but we still have some of those venture dollars left. <laughs> we, we won't. I mean, we'll just have what well, little bit we earn this year. Yeah, so yeah. earn this year to go into yeah. yeah. The 2020. And of course, interest earnings right now are pretty. Yeah, the 2020 carryover from those interest funds is going to be right. a lot less than what our 19 carryover. Now, hopefully, uh, you know, a lot of our general fund budgets in 2020. You know, with our reduced travel and everything, yeah. there's there's going to be some a uh, little bit of carry over there on those, and then the funds that are being replenished from CARES funds and stuff. So, but we those are too complicated the calculations to even predict. So we never use those in uh, next year's budget until we get our audit numbers. So. I, I thought that's what happened, but I think, you know, I can, I can. Uh, Councilor Lake. Um, so, I should have asked this when we was on the Housing Authority. Yeah, you uh, should have. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the $10,000 that we get in emergency, uh, I, know, I don't know if it needs to be passed today or how it needs to be done, but I would really like to see an increase on that for us because there's so many requests that comes in that, you know, you're out of money by October 10th <laughs> on just $10,000. And, and I don't know if we need to go through this. I, I'm, you know, this yeah, we need to ask Jody, um, what, what budget does that come out Actually, of? we normally find that out of Gen Fund, but uh, it wasn't in there this year. So, now look, it's been funded out of program income, housing authority program income this year. So, yeah. I'm not sure how much he has available, so I may need to address that separately. I, I think that we also have an earmark in there for them, for each counselor to get a small increase in the housing okay. funding through the CRM. Good. Of course, that has to be used by December 30th and, you know, still has to meet the other, you know, necessary due to COVID, that, that okay. stuff. Um, and I can... I can go over that with each of you individually or as a group to because I have a presentation about like what's allowable and what's not allowable on those that I think would maybe be beneficial for you guys as you're um, talking with other entities that you may use CRF funding to help or um, folks for housing and stuff as well. So I can relate all those requirements to you. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. I had talked to uh, Jamie last year about uh, that money that you know the ten thousand uh, dollars you know it does not carry over if you don't lose it you lose it or if you don't use it yeah if you don't use it you lose it um, and I had approached him about possibly getting that to carry over I don't know what it's used for if it doesn't but you know there's there's some districts who use it and some that don't and it would I know one year that Harley had a little bit left in his and he uh, and I had used mine, and he donated his money for some of my causes. So, you know, that's really a good thing um, among the council, uh, as councilmen, if, if we do help each other out in, in those regards, if you're not going to use it and somebody else needs it. But I don't know if there could be a way to look at that to, to, for it to carry over like everything else, or if it's too essential into what it's funding by not carrying over. That was one of the things I had recommended last year is, that, I mean, that's a policy change. It's not, nothing that you guys really have to, of, of the program was to make it where you have the total budget and based upon, the, you know, you don't have to live in a certain district to be able to qualify because in my mind, it doesn't make sense for someone to get denied because you've used all your money and and somebody, a different council member still has half of their money. I mean, it would be like saying contract hell, you get denied because you live in one or the other district. To me, it's one pot of money. So I think that would be something you'd want to address with the, with Gary on the, the actual policy for that program to make it. And, and I where, talked, you're, where you're sharing the same pot of money. Right, and I had talked to him about that in, in the past, but uh, we didn't really talk about sharing as much as just carrying it over. Right. Uh, but yeah. Well, I, see, that, and the thing to me is if, if you don't have a need this year, are you going to have a need and a half next year? I mean, if you can't spend all your money this year, 
you know, one going to help one, you next year. One know. roof is seven grand. Yeah. And so, you know, you you have three thousand dollars for the. I mean, you know, it's just very difficult not to budget that out and or just use it one shot basically. So it's it's kind of it is kind of restrictive in how you can do it if you're if you're going to try to stretch it out for a year. It's difficult. Right. One one wheelchair rents forty six hundred dollars. I like that concept about sharing, though. You know, I mean, that you know, like you say, you know, one district, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be penalized because you know you don't qualify, and somebody else has already used up the funds. I, I like that. Really. We should be able to be spend it out the same pot. Is that all right, rest of the council members? Like you say, you and Hart share it, and I know that some of you guys have too as well. Only five. Uh, <laughs> well, I was going to ask you to get some rest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be my recommendation. I think that would solve some of the problems, but that's just, I mean, that's up to you. I didn't, I didn't mean it that way. I meant if you could still share, you could still share, about, but you have to get approval from your council member. I don't mind sharing my pie, but I just don't want everybody, I don't want to be gone before I get there. <laughs> Especially the Joe Deere. <laughs> yes, Councilor Crittenden. Oh, yeah. I was going to finish up. And the only problem I see with, with sharing it and not having individual pots of money is, you know, there's just some, some districts have more housing needs than others. And, and uh, I think some of us be at the door every day, you know. So I don't know. I mean, Kind of like my little bit of that's what, and uh, I'm proud to say that that uh, this is one of this. I might even to my grandkids call this my thing. I mean, I might tell them that on the porch one day that this was my idea kind of deal. And I'm proud of that, but it was intended to be where I have a need that got denied and. You know, I kind of have that say so. And that's how it's been. It's running pretty good. The money's gone pretty fast. And of course, this admin, you know, they, I like their graph they were down the other day. <laughs> They're helping me, you know, so when, when I've been in a bind. <laughs> when I've been in a bind, you know, they've been good to go to that pot. So it, it's the right people working together. I mean, it's going to be okay either way, but. I would hate to just put it all in one fund and leave why mm -hmm. I kind of like that little bit of say so on, on having my own money. I don't know mm -hmm. who feels that way with me. And I actually think your question yeah, was, it wasn't, can it, wasn't it carry there. over? Yeah, I just want to want to know if it could, if maybe at some it could carry over. We keep our yeah, own. If you didn't use it. Yeah. Right. If we didn't use it or use all of it, That's all of it, the two thousand, the two thousand right. carried over. Yeah. You know? Okay, and I think that would still be a policy mm -hmm. issue. I don't think it's anything that we need to, to settle here on a budget today. Right, right. Okay, did you have anything else, Joe? Uh, no, I think it's it. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, our accountant. Questions or concerns or anything like that that you would like for him to clarify for you? Okay, let's get back up to tax commission. Sharon's here now. And I think that the question had to do with the uh, tobacco tax <coughs> and how that rebate works. Somebody, whoever had that question, could you, uh, could you ask? Go, go, Harley. Yes, Sharon, we were looking at the chart and I was finding it right now. But I think it was in 2010. I think the, uh, uh Harry, she explained it because I was looking at the wrong line because it had a big dip in that line. Okay. And we thought it was uh, low fuel tax. And the other was the uh, tobacco tax. Can you explain what went on that year? You mean when it went up? When it went down, then went back. Yeah, she'll, she'll get it for you there. In 2002, 
question. Okay, so in 2013, of course, is when we signed the compact. All right, and then, and also in 2013 is whenever this body passed a, a legislative act stating that instead of retaining the dollar and a half that we did, then it went to 80 cents. So we retained 80 cents and the rest of that was rebated back to the retailers. Then the tax change came in this 2016-2017 where the tax rate on cigarettes jumped from $10.30 to $20.30. But we still just maintained the 80 cents a carton. So revenue sales of number of cartons went down, which is what we base it on, and we still got 80 cents and then the rebate went out from our $10.15, which is our 50%, and the retailers get $9.35 of that. Okay. Uh, now I'm gonna understand this, Ron, right? uh, in our, let's go to 20, the 2020 budget was 18,800,000. How much, how much was that that the nation actually got then? After they paid the retailers what they paid, or what they paid them? I know you probably can't tell us now, but it's kind of chocolate I was making from that. Um, the rebate uh, that gets paid back out is approximately thirteen million four thirty is what I have in the budget. Now, is that in we're talking also uh, the nation's nation uh, tobacco stores are in this budget yes too. yes and the tobacco that's cigarettes and tobacco okay, okay. so tobacco um, out of what we get back on the tax we only retain 10 percent and 90 percent is paid back out to the retailers and I know but um, and I believe that was I want to say legislative act 30 or something. I've got it in the, the, the act and everything, but it was the, passed by this body to change that. Because previous to that, we did retain a dollar and a half. That's where I was saying it would be. I think that chart would be helpful if it was the net amount instead of the yeah, gross amount. Because we don't make. We can, we can get you a chart like that for ENF if you'd like on Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now before, when we were getting a dollar and a half. But you also got to look at the fact that carton sales have gone down due to the fact that taxes have gone up on the on the cigarettes and stuff. So, and that's all based on carton sales. Okay, and I don't know, Sharon. You might tell this committee uh, body when we rebate back to the retailer, if we're rebating back, but that we also have made payments for the retailers. Landlord, am I saying that right? No, we don't pay the landlord. They they pay their own leases. So so the retailer pays the landlord's leases. Yes. I don't know for some reason I thought we had allocated yeah. more dollars for that, but we never did. Okay. No. Now we don't pay any of their bills. That's all we do is we rebate <coughs> them back for that legislative act, the amount that they get based on carton sales. Okay. I wonder what how much we gave back when we went from a dollar fifty to eighty cents. What did that cost us? Do you have any idea? I, I can I think we yeah. did that at one point. I always have the number of cartons in here. So I think I have it on that worksheet. And I'm just asking these questions because I asked the same questions about education. If you would like, I can get that information for her. I can do go back and do her a chart on the number of cartons because I have all that information, the cartons per year and everything. And then we could calculate it at the dollar and a half and calculate it at the 80 cents. And just so that you can yeah, see that if she, if you would like that, I can do that. Yeah, I can do the, the yeah. delta between those multiple <coughs> and the curtain. Right. And the reason I bring this up is uh, we, I bought some education stuff up like that and we give the scholarships to the kids that come to school and they drop out after two weeks or a month. Here again, we're giving a lot of money too. Right. Anyway, be interesting to see. How many years would you like to see on that? From the beginning? From mm. 14? 
when it went into effect? Yeah. Okay. It went yeah. into effect in yeah. FY 2014. So I'll go back from there and I'll I'll get a chart too. I think what really caught my eye was on the report that we got from the education for scholarship goals that went from 2010 to 2021, and that was almost $10 million that, uh, that we had increased. Right. If we increased that much, and, and I know we're putting more scholarships out there. So this may be something to tighten the budget, tighten the belt on, on the scholarship. Yeah, I'll get that information to her. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the Tax Commission? <coughs> okay. Thanks for coming over, Sharon. You're welcome. Okay, we've looked at uh, um, Chief Hoskin. Do you have anything that you want to add? I think we're getting ready to vote on this budget. So if you want to make a last pitch. Please vote yes. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the council's work and I appreciate the treasurer's work. This is a year, this is a year in which we all know that the revenues uh, didn't meet what we all want them to meet. Uh, it's the most extraordinary budget in the time I've been around Cherokee Nation budget since 2007. But thanks to our treasurer, thanks to the really the hard fight for those federal dollars, uh, we can go into this year without having to make the kind of uh, very tough decisions that we might have had to make. So I appreciate uh, everyone's leadership. If there are no more questions regarding the budget, we will go ahead and vote on the budget <coughs> as it is presented. Do you have something? Yeah, I'd like to make comments. Okay. Uh, you know, this is a unique time and the circumstances that we're in. Trey, thank you for, for doing the work. And I know it's, it was difficult sometimes gathering staff to come in and, and do the work because of, of what we were, uh, the circumstances we were under. So good job. And Jody, appreciate you. And you know, our, our chair lady here, I uh, want to give, you know, commend her for doing an outstanding job. You know, she the way she runs the meeting and makes sure everything is, is, is in hand and the right questions are asked. So I want to commend our, our chairperson of the finance. So council members all together, good job. It's probably, it's, it's the biggest budget we've had and it's the shortest time to, to approve it. But that just means that, you know, it's, it's not much different. You look at the variance of each department and you kind of go from there. And Chief, you and your staff just appreciate, uh, you know, the work that you guys put into this. and. Uh, we're going to get through all of this, and it's going to be a good year. Okay. Jody? I, normally, we go to September full council, but with the way things are, I was wondering if you want to go ahead and move it to this Thursday. What do you guys council think? Member, I don't have a problem with that. Member. Okay, so, um, Joe, go ahead and amend your um, motion to pass it and go to council on the, Well, no, they can just agree to that, yeah. can't they, Shelley? Just agree to, okay, so we don't need to amend the, okay, someone else had, Trey, did you have I, I just wanted to make one quick last remark, in, in, and that is to thank my staff. Yes, have your staff stand yeah. up. Yeah. Your staff that's here. <laughs> the amount of time and effort that, that the financial resources staff has put, in, not only into this budget, but into the CRF budget and into everything else that's been going on has been pretty awe-inspiring. So they are they are fully dedicated and their their hard work deserves uh, recognition. So. And when we leave tonight, you can get reacquainted with your families who haven't <laughs> seen you <laughs> exactly. for the last two weeks. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of talks about in the Scott family tonight. So uh, yeah. cool for us here. I'm sure so. of that. Okay, with all that done, Julia, you got all the info you need? Yep. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> So, all those in favor of passing this budget, say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed to pass it? Julia, you pass? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone opposed to passing this budget? Oh, okay. We are done and this meeting's adjourned.